step closer to being built in the middle of LA's historic downtown district. The city broke ground on what is being called the new Spring Street Park. Saida Pagan has the details. One, two, this groundbreaking ceremony on South Spring Street symbolized the success of Los Angeles's continuing quest to make downtown greener and more livable. The planned Spring Street Park will be set on three quarters of an acre in the city's historic core. It's being built at the request of downtown residents longing for a peaceful place to come together. This community is very special because of the fact that people are engaged and they care. For far too long, parks in L.A.'s downtown have been a rarity, but that is beginning to change. City leaders say this planned Spring Street Park is just the latest effort to help revitalize the downtown area. Green spaces are more important than ever now that the downtown area has been experiencing a population growth. Once in a while, we do need to get away from that urban, come to some greenery, walk our dogs, uh, get to know one another. Uh, this is an asset that we need more of. We're surrounded by concrete, <laughs> and it's uh, nice to have some green space for us and to have picnics, just enjoy the outdoors doors in downtown. The park should be a beautiful one. The plans call for walking paths, seating, a water feature, and a plaza. In downtown Los Angeles, Saida Pagan for LA This Week. The Department of Recreation and Parks estimates the Spring Street Park will be open by the summer of 2013. One suspect in a botched marijuana robbery is caught. Three more are at large. Your help is needed. Bob Marley Day in Los Angeles and a musical performance at the Central Library. These stories and more in City Beat. Police are looking for three suspects who were caught on surveillance cameras robbing a medical marijuana clinic in the 1300 block of West Olympic Boulevard and shooting and injuring a security guard at around 11 a.m. on July 17th. Police have identified the suspect in sunglasses as 25-year-old Cornell White, who had frequented the clinic in the past. That's the card that was presented. Mr. White goes over and signs in on the log as he's been over there, and then the other male black with a white shirt pulls a gun from his right side, and the fight is on with the security guard. Police say White and one of the other suspects proceeded to ransack the clinic, while the third suspect held the guard down at gunpoint. The security guard was reportedly shot by one of the suspects out on the street when he chased after them. Police are still looking for White and the other two suspects, but they were able to arrest a fourth individual, the getaway driver, after locating the car hours after the robbery. You are asked to call Detective Nemiroff at 213-484-3663 if you have any information on the suspect's whereabouts. The City of Los Angeles proclaimed August 7th Bob Marley Day in the City of Los Angeles, with Ziggy and Karen Marley on hand to accept the proclamation in their late father's honor. On behalf of my father and, and my family, I just want to say thank you very much to the council and the City of Los Angeles for this great honor. Councilmember Joe Buscaino even paid tribute to Marley with one of his favorite Marley tunes. How about a little? Won't you help me sing? Come on these songs of freedom cause all I ever had come on redemption songs yes we love you Bob made with the support of the Marley family a documentary entitled Marley was made and released in April Mayor Antonio Viragosa has appointed Gary Lee Moore to the position of interim general manager of the city's information technology agency which oversees channel 35 the ITA is tasked with researching, testing, and implementing new technologies for the city, including but not limited to the city's 311 call system. Moore is currently a city engineer and general manager of the Bureau of Engineering. The Los Angeles Public Library recently played host to a free Calico Wins Quintet concert featuring classic American works by Edward McDowell, Scott Joplin, John Philip Sousa, and others. The quintet performed a diverse collection of works reflecting on the life and music of early America. The concert held at the Downtown Central Library's Mark Taper Auditorium was part of the California Read Project, created to spark statewide conversations about topics of importance to Californians. 
Lamert Park, the cultural center of the African-American community in South Los Angeles, played host to a day-long event that helps to promote the written word in all its forms. From poetry to novels to children's books, there was something for everyone. Rasha Goel has more. A vision that came to fruition six years ago has now become Southern California's largest urban literary event. This year's sixth annual Lamert Park Village Book Fair featured over 150 authors, book readings, poets, and much more. We felt that in South Los Angeles there was a great desire for individuals who wanted to uh, showcase their works, and so we just gave them an opportunity with this venue. Among the authors invited to the book fair was late singer Marvin Gaye's sister. My book is not a Motown book. It's about the family. It's about Marvin, growing up with Marvin, how Marvin became the man he was. There were books for every type of reader, young and old, and on countless subjects. I get to hear people's life story, and that encouraged me to do what I want to be and uh, how to help out other people. The community comes in, they get entertained, they have spoken word, they have musical uh, uh, demonstrations. Plus, we encourage uh, uh, all those that participate to also go and trade with the businesses that are in this village. When this event first started six years ago, promoters wanted to break down the stereotype that the African-American community was not interested in the written word. Six years later, promoters say they've done that and more, attracting book lovers from all corners of the city. From Lamert Park, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The community of Watts hosts a big annual event promoting fitness and nutrition. As Gil Reyes reports, local cops joined in on the fun with some healthy competition. <laughs> People in Watts work up an appetite while working up a sweat. Their hunger satisfied with a bounty of fresh produce at the Watts Healthy Farmers Market celebration. People can come and, and buy fresh products, fresh fruits and vegetables. And as you see behind me, the whole uh, Zumba is in effect here in Watts. Another great thing happening in Watts that we're here to support with my family and I um, as a council member of this great district. A recent report by the U.S. Department of Agriculture says more than 81,000 people in L.A. County do not have access to fresh produce. To help change this, Watts has hosted a weekly farmer's market since 2007. This farmer's market is the biggest of the year. This is my guy here. This fellow with We're the taking him down. We're taking him down. LAPD? JP. The event includes a cop cook-off contest. On one side is LAPD Southeast Division Captain Phil Tingarides. He's cooking up grilled tuna with sautéed vegetables. His opponent, L.A. County Sheriff Century Station Captain Joe Gooden. His dish is this vegetarian bruschetta. The contest ends in a draw. The winners are the attendees who get to sample all the free food courtesy of the farmer's market. Thank you for being a champion in promoting healthy eating habits to the Watts community. Bon appetit. In Watts, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. Again, that was a special once-a-year large-scale celebration, but the community hosts a smaller weekly farmer's market every Saturday at Ted Watkins Memorial Park. And in this week's list of things to do, a musical tribute to unemployment. And it's all about dragons at a local museum. Also, a summer birthday party for the father of the Los Angeles Harbor. Join Friends of Banning Museum for a fun-filled evening of dancing under the stars with music from the fabulous Esquire's Big Band and swing dance instruction by Rusty Frank. The event commemorates the birth of the father of the Los Angeles Harbor, Phineas Banning. This fourth annual summer birthday concert takes place Saturday, August 18th. Gates open at 5 p.m. General admission is $25 per person. Pack a picnic and blanket and enjoy the concert, dance instruction, and complimentary dessert on the fabulous front lawn of the mansion. Reservations are required. More info can be found at thebanningmuseum.org. We have all either gone through unemployment or know of someone who has. And so Brooklyn-based playwright, musician, and modern troubadour Ethan Lipton brings to the Grand Performances series at the California Plaza a musical ode to unemployment. The central dilemma at the heart of his show entitled No Place to Go? To follow or not to follow his long-term employer out of town. 
to Mars to be exact. While the story takes you to another planet, the experience is one that anyone facing job loss can relate to. The 8 p.m. performance on Saturday, August 18th takes place at the California Plaza located at 350 South Grand Avenue downtown. Go to grandperformances.org for more information. And bring the kids to the Los Angeles County Museum of Modern Art on Sunday, August 19th for Dragon Days. It's part of the Andell Family Sundays program. In Asia, dragons are mythical beasts that symbolize good luck. In the West, dragons are fierce and dangerous. Compare these creatures in an installation of art featuring dragons from LACMA's collection and make your own composite animals. The activity from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. is free with museum admission. LACMA is located at 5905 Wilshire Boulevard. Go to LACMA.org. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. One local boys and girls club is the lucky recipient of a brand new playground. And it didn't take a year or even a few months. In fact, you'll be surprised how much can be accomplished when a group of determined individuals get to work. Who says you can't build a playground in one day? You just built the 2,119th playground by the moon. Kaboom, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to saving play, yes, play, built this playground at the Challengers Boys and Girls Club in about six hours with help from volunteers from the Walt Disney Corporation. Have you moved 100 cubic yards of mulch by hand? Woo! 22,000 pounds of concrete by Whoa. hand. Woo! Made 12 Mendocino benches, a shade structure, whoops, uh, two planter boxes, two cubbies. You refurbished a whole bunch of bleachers, painted an amazing mural, planted 20 trees, yeah. and some sidewalk games. The Challengers Boys and Girls Club was started in 1968 by Lou Danzler, who took kids to the park on the back of his truck. He was taking kids to the park on, uh, on the days when he wasn't working. He started out with 12 kids, and then the next week he doubled that. He had 24 and then 36, and it began to grow and grow and grow. And he was making two or three different trips back and forth to the park. Uh, for doing something for kids in the community. Today, Corey Danzler is continuing his father's legacy, serving as the CEO and president of what would become the Challengers Boys and Girls Club. The organization's first building was a Vons supermarket, which the grocery giant deeded over to Lou Danzler for a dollar. More than four decades later, the Challengers Boys and Girls Club at 5029 South Vermont Avenue takes up a whole city block, complete with tennis courts, a running track, and now a playground. The playground will be named Ruby's Playland after Dantzler's mother, Ruby. She was the guiding light and the friend and the partner and the wife that was there all along the way. And this family, everybody, they're truly special when you think of the number of kids who come here. And the kids who come to the Challengers Boys and Girls Club will now have a safe playground right on the premises to hop, skip, and dance the day away, all in a day's work. According to Kaboom, currently only one in five kids has a safe place to play within walking distance from their homes. Kaboom is fighting to end that deficit one playground at a time. And that's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at LACityView.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We leave you now with the sights and sounds of the Calico Winds Quintet performing at the LA Central Library. See you back here next week for more of LA This Week.
Managing your expenses can be challenging during difficult financial times. If you or your family has recently suffered a loss of income, you may now qualify for the Department of Water and Power's Residential Low Income Discount Program. The LADWP offers customers within qualifying income levels a subsidy on the cost of electric and water services for their primary residence. In addition, income qualified senior citizens and disabled customers may be eligible for a discount counted lifeline rate. Customers on life support equipment and those who meet the physician's certified requirements may also apply for a discounted rate. To find out if you qualify for any of these discounts and to receive a low income discount application, please visit our website at www.ladwp.com. City View Channel 35. Your city, your channel.
Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to your Los Angeles City Council meeting. The Los Angeles City Council meets on every Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m. Public is welcome. Uh, we also have a, a variety of committee hearings during the week. You can attend to watch your government work or even uh, give public comments on the various items that come before these committees. Uh, it, it is my understanding, Madam Clerk, that we do have a, a quorum, so if we could uh, call the roll, run quickly through the agenda, and then we'll start with Ms. Perry in this say week. Alarcon Buscano, Cardinals, Ingler Garcetti, we start Caress, Gregorian, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rose, and Zion, West, and 10 members present in a quorum, Mr. President. Okay, uh, what's the uh, first order of business? Approval of the minutes. Mr. Parks moves, Mr. Reyes seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Cardinals moves, Mr. Englander seconds. Next. Items one through seven are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, specials members. Items one, Mr. Parks. Number two. Okay, number Good. two for Mr. Parks. Uh, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. If we could uh, move item one to August 31st. Okay, Aug there's been a request to continue item one to August 28th. 31st. 31st. So without objection, Mr. Parks? Yeah, uh, we could dispose of that item to just, we'd like to make a uh, technical amendment and just amend the ZA report and to add uh, they, uh, t number 28 through 32, which were voluntary conditions. We'd like to have those uh, reinstated. Okay, so that's on item two. item two. And with that technical amendment, we can just roll it. That's correct? right. Okay, any other specials? Madam Clerk, we should prepare to... Uh, to vote, if you could open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next section. Items 8 through 12 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes required for consideration. Okay, without objection, those uh, items are now before us. Do we have uh, cards? Cards on items 9, 11, and 12. Specials members, specials. Okay, Madam Clerk, this prepare to, to vote on the remaining items. If you would please uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. What's the next section, uh, Madam Clerk? Mr. President, that is the special meeting agenda if you, if, if you wish to go into that later. No, let's skip that because it's, we can't have that until 10.15 anyway. So let's go to uh, items 14 and 15. That's also part of the special meeting. Oh, is it? Okay, well then we'll deal with what we have. And uh, with that said, uh, Ms. Perry, for... I, uh, I was at the mic and I wanted to call item three special. Okay, item three for Ms. Perry. In order to do that, let's have a vote on reconsideration. On item three, let us open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay, Ms. Perry, that uh, will be reconsidered. And item 14 should go forthwith. We haven't gotten there yet. It's part of the special meeting. So, if you could uh, begin the presentation. Follow me. All right, great. Thank you, and Mr. Huizar will join us in a moment. Nisei Week draws visitors from around the globe to Little Tokyo in the city of Los Angeles. This is an important event and one of the oldest and largest Japanese-American traditions that promote goodwill and cultural exchange. This year's Nisei Week is the 72nd year. This past weekend, the festivities were kicked off with the fourth annual Tanabata Festival. If you have not seen Tanabata before, it is a beautiful sight. Thousands of handmade flowers and streamers adorn the kazaris on display, many of them shipped in to Los Angeles from Japan. Now, I got into the spirit four years ago and competed for the fourth year, and we did place third in the government category, so I'm happy about that, and we're going to keep trying. Another important part of the festival is the Nisei Week Court. This past week, 
The Queen of Nisei Week, a tradition that honors exceptional young women, women, was selected. Now each one of these young women had distinguished themselves within their respective communities and represent the virtue and the values that distinguishes Nisei Week and the Nisei Week Festival. So it's my pleasure to introduce and to welcome this year's court. And I'll do this one at a time and ask them to join me. The Queen, Emily Michi Ijima Folick. Queen Emily has shown compassion and maturity in competing in triathlons benefiting the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. She is currently a graduate of UC Irvine with a degree in fashion design. And I'm going to introduce the, the rest of the court if, and then you can say a bit about them when I'm done, okay? Um, Crystal Akie Hanano, First Princess. Caitlin Chie Sakurai, Miss Tomodachi. Lauren Mieko Tanaka Arai, Princess. Marcy Saori Asao, Princess. Sarah Michelle Fujimoto, Princess. And let's see. Erica Fisher. Erica Fisher. Erica Hayami Fisher, Princess. Okay. And of course, the outgoing 2012 Nisei Week Foundation President, Reverend Mark Nakagawa. And their chaperone, Nikki Kodama. And let me not forget Hal Kaimi, photographer. Everybody say hello to Hal. I would like to commend the outstanding work of Reverend Mark Nakagawa and the entire Nisei Week Foundation. It has been a joy and an honor to join the organizers of Nisei Week and the entire little Tokyo community in celebrating the 72nd Nisei Week Japanese Festival. Um, the Queen, uh, I would like for her to just say a few words about the members of her court. And each year is special because each, each court has something unique, unique interests, unique backgrounds. But what I think makes them, what holds them together or what binds them together over 72 years is they distinguish themselves in their intelligence, in their poise, their commitment to community, their pursuit of values that are important to not only to their families, but they make their community proud. And uh, uh, this year is beyond our expectations, and each year they continue to rise. So with that, I would ask Queen Emily to share a bit about her court. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Perry. Each one of the members of the court represents a different area of Los Angeles County. I actually represent our neighbors, Orange County. First Princess Crystal Hanano represents West Los Angeles. Princess Erica Fisher represents Pasadena. Princess Lauren Tanaka Adii represents San Fernando Valley. Over here we have Miss Tomodachi, which is kind of like our Miss Miss Congeniality, our friendly princess. <laughs> she represents the Torrance area. Princess Marcia Sao actually represents the Japanese Restaurant Association of America. And Princess... <laughs> sorry. Princess Sarah <laughs> Fujimoto, I'm so sorry. She represents the East San Gabriel Valley. Each one of them are wonderful women who have shown great support for our, the culture and community of the Japanese American, which is why they were all selected to represent all of Southern California when we travel to different countries and areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Queen Emily. Let's give them a big hand. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Labange. I want to thank everybody. As you know, Nagoya is our oldest sister city. The mayor of Nagoya was here, had a wonderful time, and it's great to see all the princesses and also the colleges that you represent uh, around the state. What great success. 
Mr. Chair, good to see you as well. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much, and I encourage all of you to come out and enjoy the festivities this weekend in Little Tokyo, and join us in the street as the festivities end for Ondo uh, dancing together as one community. Uh, thank you very much. I believe the Queen and her court have uh, programs to distribute to each of the members, and uh, if you'd like to do that now. No? Oh, great, great. Oh, okay. Let me ask if they can. Yeah. Uh, if uh, we can indulge uh, every year, the Queen and her court, they always come directly to the council members and they split up and they hand the programs directly to them. So if we could do that this time, just take a moment, uh, I would really appreciate it. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Let's split up. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank you. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I'm proud of you. Yes. Mr. Cardenas, tone, tone, Mr. Cardenas, uh, you're not quite, uh, okay, you know what, let me, uh, m before I call on Mr. Buscaino, let me uh, present w probably the, the cutest dog in America. Mr. Reyes, could you please take the president's chair? Our Council President Herb Wesson with his presentation. Yeah, I just heard that. Okay, thank you, Mr. President and members. Mr. Koretz, Rich, I need Mr. Koretz's full attention. Mr. Paul Cooper Koretz, look at this. Look at this bundle of joy that. I believe that he will only get to be about 10 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. This is a poodle mix. A poodle... Uh, like a multi-poodle. We think like a multi-poodle. What is a multi-poodle? Well, anyway, he's got some poodle in him and a little cocker spaniel, okay? And uh, he's only going to get a little bigger. I think he weighs about four pounds now, and the projection is that he's going to be uh, 10 pounds. Uh, he's ready to go. He's neutered and microchipped. He's neutered and microchipped. His name is Timmy. His name is Timmy. Uh, Timmy is about how old? He's two months old. Timmy is a puppy. He's two months, two months old. And the sweetest thing, looking for a home. And if one of our valiant <laughs> members from the military <laughs> were to adopt this dog, I'll pay for half of the cost, okay? Did you? <laughs> I'll, any way I can sell them, I'm selling them. Anyway, uh, if you ever wanted unconditional love, I mean, I don't think you could beat this. Mr. Kretz, what do we have here? Oh, look at Mr. Kretz. There's a picture of my, my daughter when she was a baby and a dog that looked exactly like this next to her. I don't know if you can get a picture of it. Now, it's a little little small I don't know if you can get the picture I but I would I know your daughter Rachel let's do let's let's do deja vu this it was the most wonderful dog we ever met this 
Just adorable, and this looks just like it. Beautiful. But anyway, if you ever wanted unconditional love, you get it from a companion animal. I truly believe that we will find a home for Timmy and that we will find that home for Timmy today. Uh, he is very special. It's a poodle and a cocker spaniel mixed. And uh, maybe you could show the dog to some of the people that are here in a, the audience. You do have a customer on the queue, customer? We do have a, we have Customer Cardenas? Okay, Mr. Cardenas. Every, every time we do the adoption, and thank you so much, Council President, for doing this and constantly raising the awareness that not only this beautiful little creature needs to be adopted and will be, I'm sure, that we have thousands as well, but I'm just, I just wanted to say I'm just praying that my wife, Norma, and my kids are not watching this right now because they will adopt this cute little guy quickly. I'm just amazed that he's not adopted yet because the attention he got in the back while he was waiting was just phenomenal. But, but he is a, 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 a wonderful, wonderful pet. And I uh, just want to do a shout out to any of you who have dogs or cats and love animals. Uh, please, please adopt. And this little guy, I would imagine, is going to go quickly. Thank well, you. He, he was adopted, but an evil significant other vetoed the adoption okay yeah I outed you anyway uh, so if anybody would like to uh, adopt this little guy please do it uh, by chance if if he is not adopted while he's here call 888-452-7381 we have a 100 percent dog adoption rate and we want to keep that going the last thing that I will say is that if we don't get these pets adopted, they're put to death. So what you're doing when you adopt this dog, you're saving the life of another dog because we have uh, additional room to keep another dog for a while. So get a companion animal, save a life. We will uh, be here for a bit in the back until somebody decides to adopt Timmy. And he's Customer only two Card months old, so you can change his name if you don't like Timmy. Councilman Cardinal would like to add a few uh, words. Uh, 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 Council President Wesson, I need to clarify, we have a 100% adoption rate when we bring them to council. Yes. We unfortunately yeah, when we, we bring still, them to council. We don't have 100%, not even close, when it comes to our shelter. So, so no. let's keep the 100% no. here at council. But we do, we do have many, many animals that get put down. Sorry Maybe I that. should begin bringing them here a thousand at a clip. There you go. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to have our great volunteer give you a special secret about Timmy. Well, Timmy is very, very curious, loves to explore, and loves to kiss. So if you have somebody at home that doesn't mind getting kissed, he definitely loves to kiss. Okay, okay with that said, we're going to have Timmy in the back. I'm going to ask you to just give him like you're walking on the runway. Can see I let him walk? He can, can he walk? But nobody can see him. Anyway, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Thank you, Council President Wesson. Um, for our next presentation, Councilman Garcetti. Councilman Buscaino. Like to come on up. Councilman Buscaino. Good morning, sir. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Come on. Let's help. Come on up. Yeah, of course. Your family here. Great. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up and join us. Come on. Come right here. here. Great. Colleagues, I uh, have the privilege today of honoring the uh, men and women who serve our nation since 19. Let's give them a round of applause. Let's go. These, these men are unbelievable. We love you. Thank you. We. Since 1997, we've been celebrating Navy Days in Los Angeles. Every year, we welcome a ship to port in support of the Navy League, which promotes and educates the public about the sea services, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. It is great to welcome the USS Wayne E. Meyer, an Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer, and your crew from your home port of San Diego. This is a fairly new ship having been commissioned in 2009 and recently completed its first overseas deployment to Malaysia, Japan, South Korea, Thailand, Dubai, and the Philippines. The LA waterfront has a rich naval tradition. 
It was once the home of battleships and is a former and now future home of the USS Iowa. Todd shipyards used to build guided missile cruisers. However, following the end of the Cold War, we saw our military presence shrink dramatically. With the demise of the El Toro Marine Air Base, the Long Beach Shipyard, and the Long Beach Naval Station, the military presence in the LA Basin is just about non-existent. LA Air Force Base by LAX and its Air Force housing in San Pedro is all that remains of our military infrastructure. Hence the need to keep the general public informed about the young men and women who are putting their lives on the line for duty for our country. In addition, of course, the sailors have always had a great time both on and off the ship. Uh, you can see the look of pride on their faces as they explain to moms, dads, and children uh, that tour the ship what they do or operate. This year we expect 45 to, 45 to 5,000 people per day to see and tour the ship this weekend and several hundred kids today and tomorrow. And I encourage everyone to come down to San Pedro, the harbor area, and visit the LA waterfront and make a day out of it. This year there are more attractions than ever. Docked alongside the USS Wayne E. Meyer, we have the Battleship of Presidents, the USS Iowa. Visitors this weekend can see the Navy of today and the Navy of yesterday. Today I am joined by my colleague, Navy, Naval Reserve Officer Lieutenant Eric Garcetti as well. Um, we welcome you to, as well to come speak and say a few words, Eric. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buscaino and a great council member. You've already shown in your short time you've brought a battleship to San Pedro. So <laughs> I don't know where you go from there, but uh, you have done amazing things and I appreciate it. And it is wonderful to welcome the USS Wayne E. Myers and to have such a strong support from our civilian side here for Navy Days each year. And I want to welcome Commander Will Baxter. Um, skipper of the Wayne Myers, uh, his wife, the First Lady of the Wayne E. Myers, uh, Liesl Baxter, and of course the EXO. It's, you know, the, the skipper gets to do all the fun stuff. The EXO has to be the hard ass, so he's here as well. <laughs> uh, Another Commander, Randy Von Russum, as well as Lieutenant, Lieutenant Junior Grade uh, Chance Harding, who's a maintenance officer. Um, we see the men and women who serve in uniform, and actually I would say LA still continues to have a, a large military presence in the sense Los Angeles gave more people and has given more people to the global war on terror, both in terms of people who have served and lives lost than any other urban area in America. Uh, it is a responsibility and a privilege to serve, uh, but the men and women who are part of the United States Navy, a global force for good, one that is on the scene first when there are disasters, that rolls out when there are emergencies, and that is able to not only protect uh, this nation, but to be able to do good around the world in moments of emergency. Um, as you know, formerly I was part of uh, Compact Fleet. Um, now I'm stationed actually in the LA Basin area uh, with a joint unit. But when I see those surface warfare officers who are out there and those who serve in surface warfare on the enlisted side as well, they are the ones who are the, uh, the edge of the spear. They are the pointed edge of the spear the ones that are out there uh, protecting our freedoms, and I want to welcome them. I'm proud to serve alongside you, and I want to thank our great council member from the port area. I think we'll continue to grow that Navy tradition. And for uh, young people today looking for a great career, looking for a way to join something, don't talk to Dennis Zine. He recruits for the Army. Army's okay, but Navy has won 10 years in a row our football games. We're a superior fighting force. We're brothers, but we are better, and please join the United States Navy. With that, I want to thank Grant Ivey as well, and Bill Griggs, our two great uh, folks who have always been uh, here at the forefront making sure we get great ships, great people, uh, great servicemen and women here, and I want to thank him for his great service and the many opportunities we've had together as well. Thank you, Councilmember Garcetti. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, in, uh, introduce the um, gentleman behind me, um, the uh, commanding officer, Will Baxter, who is joined by his wife, Liesl. And we had an opportunity uh, with the, uh, the captain yesterday, last night, and his team and some of the servicemen uh, to um, celebrate their arrival at the San Pedro Brewing Company. We had a great dinner and had an opportunity just to share the great things that are happening in life. Uh, joining um, Captain Baxter is Bill Griggs, Vice President of Late Navy Days Los Angeles, the ship's XO, Commander Ra Randy Van Rossum, the maintenance officer, Lieutenant Junior Grade Chance Harding, and I want to invite uh, the captain to come say a few words. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Councilman Buscaino and uh, Councilman Garcetti. It's an absolute pleasure to be up here. 
Uh, Mr. President, distinguished councilmen, and uh, citizens of Los Angeles, it is an honor to address uh, the Los Angeles City Council uh, and the wonderful citizens of Los Angeles. The officers, chiefs, and crew of Wayne E. Meyer are delighted to be here and participate in LA Navy Days. We look forward to interacting with as many people as possible to show them the pride that we have in our Navy and what we do in defense of our country. As, Con as Councilman uh, Buscaino uh, talked about, L LA is a maritime city, and as a nation, we are a maritime nation. The Navy directly contributes to the economy by ensuring that the sea lanes remain secure, free, and open. Having Wayne Meyer here in Los Angeles is an opportunity for the citizens of this great city to gain a better understanding of how the Navy defends the freedoms we have come to enjoy. If you have the opportunity to visit with the sailors, you will find that they're extraordinarily capable, motivated, and dedicated to their service. As you interact with them and learn about their experiences, I am confident you will recognize the pride that they have in serving our nation. I want to offer each of you my sincerest gratitude for all that you do for this community, for the Navy, and the nation. Thank you for your dedicated support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now the, uh, the President of Navy Days, uh, I'd like to ask Grant Ivey to say a couple words. We'd like to thank uh, Los Angeles and the Port of Los Angeles for their great hospitality and in welcoming the, uh, uh, the, the good ship Wayne E. Meyer, and uh, we're sorry, but the, the tours are all sold out. But next year, we're going to ask the Navy for more ships so yes. we can educate all the public about the great service our Navy does out at the ocean. So thank you very much, and go Navy. All right. Fantastic. Take a quick photo here. Come on back. Yeah, yours is for This is Grant. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is for Come on in front of the podium. Okay. You're no visitor here. Relax there, Councilor Zion, relax. Councilor Zion? Well, it's on the speaker queue, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge uh, the United States Navy and the wonderful work you do. People don't realize what you folks go through, the training. I, thanks to uh, our uh, fine Mr. Garcetti, First Lieutenant, United States Navy, uh, I had an opportunity to go on the USS Stennis, an aircraft carrier, and I got an opportunity to f go out on the COG and spend uh, a few days on that, which was quite an experience. But to see the dedication of the Navy personnel. It was absolutely mind-boggling. And to see how they all work together as a team to protect the nation. And the people really don't realize the sacrifices that you folks go through serving this country and the careers that are established within the United States Navy. I serve on the U.S. Army Advisory Board, and I know that whether it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, National Guard, whatever it is, it's our military that we need to acknowledge and show respect and support for. And I want to congratulate my colleagues for bringing you folks forward because it's important that every American understands what you folks do to protect our freedom and democracy. And as you see in front of my desk here, that flying flag and what that represents, what you folks represent, I just want to acknowledge and show our appreciation for what you do, what your family sacrifice, uh, and the risk that you take. And we know that this world is in crisis, and any moment uh, something dangerous could happen, and you folks are there to protect the people, not only in this country, but around the globe. So congratulations, and thank you for coming here. Uh, and from San Pedro to Hollywood to the San Fernando Valley, we all appreciate what you folks are doing. So God bless you, and, and safe missions, and you've got Lieutenant Colonel, right? You're going to be Lieutenant Colonel someday, Eric Garcetti. Our first Lieutenant, I know. Uh, Commander of the United States Navy. God bless you. Thank you, folks. And Mr. Garcetti, since it is a fact that you have a relationship with President Obama, I would like for you to give him a call so that you can get permission from the President to wear your Navy whites when we honor your uh, brothers and sisters, because I, I, I really think you'd cut a mean figure in your Navy whites. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, these are the people that protect us. Let's give them a round of applause.
And Mr. President, yes. very quickly, uh, I would like to present a plaque to the uh, LA City Council uh, presented on the occasion of our visit to Los Angeles for uh, Navy Days LA 2012. Thank you very no. much for the wonderful hospitality. No, thank you. If you would give that to Mr. Garcetti or Mr. Buscaino, thank you. and maybe uh, Joey B, Mr. Buscaino, Mr. Garcetti, maybe we could find a place within uh, the back or somewhere to uh, display that. Uh, we are honored to receive it from you, sir. Thank you. Give him another round of applause. Okay, maybe we could uh, quickly yep. take up an item as I wait for Mr. Uh, Cardenas. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Arnold Sachs. We're going to go, we're going to do num item nine, Mr. Arnold Sachs, if you'd please come forward. Mr. Arnold Sachs, okay, if not, I don't see Arnold, I'll hold item nine. We will switch and go to uh, item uh, three, Ms. Perry. And we have public comment cards, but I'll let you begin. I'll just open, open it up, and then uh, the coalition uh, of people who are here today uh, can speak very well. This is a broad coalition of concerned people, city officials, law enforcement, internet pri privacy experts, nonprofits, and survivors of human trafficking. They have come together to send a strong message that Californians need and demand stronger laws to fight sexual exploitation here in our state. I am very proud to partner with California Against Slavery and the Safer California Foundation to urge the City Council to support my resolution in support of Proposition 35, Stop Human Trafficking in California. Proposition 35 is an initiative designed to fight back against human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of women and children in California. What's most alarming is that it is taking place here in our own city. In fact, Los Angeles has been identified as one of three cities in California identified by the FBI as a high-intensity child sex trafficking area. The CASE Act is scheduled for the November 2012 statewide general election ballot. Its purpose is to strengthen penalties against human trafficking and improve Megan's law against online predators. Current California law offers little protection for victims targeted by human traffickers and online predators. We need to change this. There are many vulnerable women and young girls in our communities. Any one of them can be a victim held against their will and forced to sell their bodies. The victims are often young girls as young as 12 years old who are sexually exploited for financial gain of human traffickers. By supporting this resolution today, you support the largest single movement against human trafficking in the United States. And now in just a moment, you're going to hear from Daphne Fung, who's the founder of California Against Slavery, Chris Kelly, former chief privacy officer at Facebook, a wonderful, incredible woman, and a survivor, Carissa Phelps, Kim Biddle, who's from the executive director of Saving Innocence, and thank you to Kim and Kenyatta Lethridge, uh, and Diana Zolikoffer, and Alexandra Daytig, thank you very much putting this together and then I'll speak after they're done to close. Okay, Ms. Perry, we already had a public uh, hearing on that on this this morning, but it's such a, a critical issue and we applaud you for uh, moving this council in the right direction where it relates to this issue. So if it's okay with you, uh, a minute each, you have about 11 cards. Is that okay, Ms. Perry? 
Someone over what? Uh, a minute each. Oh, well, one minute each. Because oh. we already had the yeah. public hearing, but I yeah. would like for them to speak. Yeah. Is that, okay, so yeah, that's fine. a minute is fine. So uh, the cards that I have are uh, Chris Kelly, if you could come forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Members. I'm Chris Kelly. I'm an investor, the founder of the Safer California Foundation, the former Chief Privacy Officer of Facebook. We're very glad to be here today sharing the progress we're making in fighting human trafficking and especially the stories of the victims who are here with us today. While it's hard for many to acknowledge, every night there are thousands of girls and boys who are exploited sexually on the streets of America, including right here in Los Angeles. Proposition 35, the CASE Act, will do three things. It will toughen criminal penalties against trafficking and correct unreasonable readings of current laws that make prosecution under state law more difficult. It will train law enforcement to recognize and build trafficking cases, and it will update Megan's law for the digital age by requiring electronic identifiers uh, for all sex offenders, all convicted sex offenders. Uh, I was proud to work on the online upgrades that we need for this system at Facebook. We got them implemented in the state of New York. I'm looking forward to our home state stepping forward, and your endorsement of this initiative is a huge step forward in making that happen. So thank you very much, Council Member Perry, Council Member Buscaino, who's the first to come on on this, and we appreciate, uh, we'll appreciate your support. Thank you. Nick Ippolito, followed by Lisa Gers Gersikoff. Good morning, Council Members. My name is Nick Ippolito. I'm representing Los Angeles County Supervisor Don Kanabi. Um, earlier this year, the LA County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to support the CASE Act. This is an issue of paramount importance to the supervisor um, in, in dealing with this heinous, outrageous issue. That's why he directed the LA County Probation Department to um, give these girls an opportunity for a new life and a chance to heal by providing additional services and, and um, uh, resources for them. But we must also deal with the real criminals here, the pimps who forcibly coerce and manipulate young girls into selling their bodies for their financial benefit. The CASE Act would be a major step forward into, set, into enacting tougher penalties and putting an end to the physical and mental abuse of these young girls. And Supervisor Kanabi uh, would like to extend his personal thanks and gratitude to Councilwoman Perry and the entire City Council for their leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, followed by Alexandra Daytig. Good morning. I'm Leslie Gersikoff. I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Labor Committee and the Chairman of Los Angeles Network to End Slavery. We appreciate Councilwoman Perry's efforts to bring this to the public, to bring this to Los Angeles. Human trafficking is a labor issue. Sex trafficking is the worst, most depraved of human trafficking. Am I still unconnected? So every victim of human trafficking has no representation for their plight. 100% of their earnings are stolen. They have no safety on the job. This is something that is more depraved than most people want to think about on a daily basis, and it, we're enabling it to happen as long as we don't support legislation, law enforcement, and public awareness that will stop it. Thank you. Thank you. Alexandria, followed by Olita Miller. Good morning, members of the Los Angeles City Council. I support the CASE Act, especially because it would generate funding to train law enforcement to recognize when they are dealing with victims of sex trafficking and mandates human traffickers register as sex offenders. Today, my life is good. I have been able to achieve many things that I never thought I could, and have been successful in reaching my goals with the help of those who believe in me. But this was not always the case for me. The first time a sex trafficker approached me was when I was 16 years old. And even though I escaped being trafficked at that time, bullying in school and alcoholic rage at home led to my dropping out of high school, which made me vulnerable to predators. By the time I was 22 years old, I had been manipulated, drugged into a bad life where I had been trafficked for nine months. Already at risk, I had become a hardcore drug addict and alcoholic because substance abuse was a required requirement of my so-called profession. At the age of 22, I also took drastic measures to change my life and, and turn in those who trafficked me. It took a long time for my life to get better because I never received the counseling I so badly needed. 
I know that the officers I worked with cared about me and wanted me to succeed and get away from a bad life. But they were lacking the tools to show me how. Alex, I had to find those tools on my own. Alex, you got to wrap it up. Just thank you. one last sentence. Thank you, President. Okay, thank you, because I don't... I w would have to give more time to other people. So thank you, Councilman. Well, thank you. I, I have a good life today, but we need to help those get the help they need now while they still have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Olita Miller, followed by Daphne. I Hello, I am Delita Miller. I am a survivor as well as a parent of a survivor, as well as an advocate for victims um, and survivors in this population. It is important that we support Proposition 35 because as a parent of survivor, my daughter was, vic was a victim. She had to testify in, her, in a case and we had to be relocated from our homes. At the same time she was a victim, she has also been so convicted a as a sex trafficker, uh, I'm sorry, as a prostitute. And I find it rather um, appalling for a child to be a victim as well as a criminal at the same time. And this proposition is very important because what it will do is when girls are, you know, approached with, by law enforcement, instead of being arrested, they will be treated as victims. That is very important that these children who, who have been raped, abused, and harmed be treated as victims and not thank, criminals. Thank, thank you. you very no, much. Thank you. Daphne, followed by uh, Kim Biddle. And Daphne, it's good to see you again. I saw you this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Council, Member, uh, Council Member Perry, for leading this. Um, I'm actually going to surrender my time to Carissa Phelps. She's at, at the age of 12, she fell victim to this crime at Fresno. So, but I do want to just say that. Um, Daphne, why don't you just speak and then let's get a card from. Uh, was it Miss Bell? Uh, Carissa Phelps. She has yeah. a card, but I want to give her more time because she's got she's got more a uh, powerful. L just give your okay great story, then we'll have her. But I don't have a card on her. Oh, you don't. Okay. So if I could get that, because we definitely want to hear from her. So yeah. go on, Daphne. Sure. So uh, human trafficking is the most underrecognized form of child abuse, gender inequality, human rights and civil rights violation in our society today. And yet, very little is being done about it. So Prop 35, the purpose of Prop 35 is to change the law to recognize this as a severe crime that it is, and also to recognize that the victims are victims. We need to start, we, and, and you know what, the, the great thing about Prop 35 is that we do know that Californians are ready to start doing this. And we thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Kim, followed by Kenyatta Lethbridge, I think, followed by Clarissa Phelps. Yes. Hi, my name is Kim Biddle. I'm from Saving Innocence. Uh, we are an advocacy agency. We actually work in partnership with law enforcement and the Supreme Court to work with children who are trafficked for sex in Los Angeles. And I just want to challenge the council and Americans that live in our city that the health of our society is determined by the health of our children, the health of future generations, and the safety of our communities. And communities cannot be safe if our children are not protected. Uh, these are our daughters. These are our nieces. These are our little sisters. I've worked with children as young as 11 years old. Law enforcement has found young girls as young as eight years old being sold for sex on our streets, in our communities, being bought by the men who work in our offices. This is an outrageous uh, civil rights act of our time. History will remember how you respond to re-abolish slavery in today's time. History will remember how you protected today's children. So thank you for your time, and I just encourage us all to vote yes on Prop. 35. Thank you. Kenyatta, followed by Carissa. Hi, my name is Kenyatta Lethrich. I'm a writer, director, and also on the board of the Mary Magdalene Project. Um, I'm happy that this proposition is, all, is going to be on the ballot because I think it's going to finally let people, make people aware that this is happening in our country. 
It's happening in California. You have children who are being taken from Los Angeles up to San Francisco and then back down to San Diego. And these are children. They're in the sixth grade. They're in the fifth grade. Um, and so, like I said, thank you for recognizing this and putting it on the ballot. We also need to recognize that these men who are pimps and these men who are Johns, they need to be accountable for statutory rape. Uh, the women who come into our organization, they do come in as adult women, but what most people don't understand is that they started at 11. And so thank you for bringing attention to this and raising people's awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Clarissa Phelps, followed by Diana Zolikoffer. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Perry. So today is a, is a historic day, as was mentioned, for the support of Proposition 35, but everything you do after today is the most important. What goes into action, what actually happens, because Los Angeles has some of the worst neighborhoods for trafficking, because Los Angeles is known for consuming children on their streets, we need to stop that. And part of Proposition 35 is to take the internet and push people that are trafficking children off of the internet and get them, hopefully, get them criminalized off of the internet. But if they come back onto our streets in Los Angeles, we need to be prepared. The streets that they're on currently, Figueroa, Long Beach Boulevard, you know, we, got, we have to go into these neighborhoods. We have to be a part of it, and we have to open community members' eyes. So it's important that all businesses get involved in this because they also will be held accountable if they participate and profit off of children. Thank you. Di Diana, followed by Marshall, Marshall McLean. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council, for letting me speak. My name is Diana Zolikoff, a writer, producer, and also a board member of the Mary Magdalene Project. Um, over the year of doing um, Innocent Flesh here in L.A. and New York, we met with law enforcement officers and also DAs and prosecutors who talked that they felt that their hands were tied, that the only thing that they felt that they could do to help a child was to arrest them, because at least they knew for that night they were safe. But then that leads to other issues as well. So we need to be aware as we're protecting our children that the men need to be held accountable, that things that are happening, the internet is fantastic, but at the same time, they're making us blind to what's going on. A lot of parents don't know what their children are into, and it, then it becomes too late. Prop 35 is important because it's about protecting our children and bringing awareness and holding accountability to the people that are involved, and we cannot be afraid of that. As Americans and as human beings, we cannot be afraid of that. Thank you. Marshall, one of our own. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm here uh, not just as a father, as a uh, father of two young girls, uh, uncle of two young girls, as a, as a husband as well. I'm also a police officer at an international airport where just about everything's trafficked through LAX. All eyes are always on this state. All eyes are always on this council and this city. So a message needs to be sent. It needs to be loud and clear. It shouldn't be 60%, 70%. It needs to be a message across the board that this is important to everybody and everybody needs to take note of this. Um, I'm also the president of Los Angeles Airport Police Officers Association. I'm also on the board of the Peace Officers Research Association of California. So you have over 60,000 law enforcement throughout the state saying that this is something that people need to wake up and, and do something about this. Thank you for your time. Have a good morning. No, thank you. In fact, thank each and every one of you for coming down and telling us your very compelling stories. Mr. Herman, you know it's too late to submit a card once we begin discussing the item, and we just got the card. So with that said, uh, I want to go to Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you so much to the coalition that is here today. Thank you to Councilwoman Jan Perry. Thank you to Councilmember Buscaino and to everybody who has spoken out. It's good to see my friend Chris Kelly, see Leslie, all the folks that are a part of this incredible coalition. There are more human slaves that are alive on the face of the earth today than at any point in human history. And when people hear that, I think they're shocked to know that statistic, but it is true. It's an issue that my wife and I have served uh, privately uh, uh, on for many, many years. And here publicly, I really want to single out also a partner of mine for a number of years in this issue, Mr. Cardenas, who 
has helped here in the city of Los Angeles make sure that Los Angeles Police Department has one of the finest task forces to deal with human trafficking. Mr. Cardenas put forward, now you see on LAPD and city cars, no human trafficking and the whole campaign. Because it's one thing to strengthen our laws, and we must do this, and we support this today. But we all must be the eyes and ears to see the signs of trafficking in our communities as well. At massage parlors and our mini malls, of course on our streets when we see street prostitution, on the internet. But we must see those warning signs and we're training our city employees and our law enforcement officers to do the same thing. Um, I was just this weekend with Demi Moore who has spent a lot of time working on this issue as well, working on some of the technology issues on the internet to be able to find those folks who would pray. And it's fitting that we had our Navy week presentation because as an officer in the United States Navy, the U.S. military has actually been one of the folks at the cutting edge when trafficking, trafficking in persons training. Every year we go through that, whether it's Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, to be those eyes and ears globally to stop this global scourge. After arms and after drugs, human beings are the third most trafficked criminal act in this world. And the fact that there are more slaves alive today than ever before, it's not just that we are a center for those that are trafficked here. We are a source for those who are trafficked out of Los Angeles. We've seen young girls from South Los Angeles in places like Italy and South Africa used as prostitutes coming from here. And so, of course, today we very loudly speak out for Prop 35. We continue the services of the so many great organizations here, organizations, many that are here, and also want to single out CAST, which helped, among with other groups, get a new visa to help, help trafficked victims be able to stay here instead of being returned to their uh, uh, environments where they will often get re-trafficked if we just send them home. And again, thank all the coalition that has come together to make sure that California says this is a slavery-free state and we'll be an example of the world till slavery is ended around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. I stand to support this incredibly important act Thank you, Councilman Perry, the eloquent words, Councilman Garcetti, Councilman Buscaino, Councilman Cardenas. Uh, the other night, I saw the statistic that there are about 2.5 million people, victims to human trafficking. 2.5 million in the world. And when you look at this F grade that California has, and to see how Los Angeles is one of those main point destinations, it truly is a shame. We as Angelinos need to understand the punishment, the evil that occurs when a child is held in a room no larger than a storage room, not allowed to go to the restroom, windowless for days on end, if not weeks, to be abused by individuals who look like Joe's citizen in our streets. Our officers need to learn and understand what it takes to change this environment. But more importantly, we need to see ourselves as Angelinos in the way that we are taking our responsibility in changing this environment. So on behalf of all those children, all those young ladies, we need to make a difference. And so I'm hoping that we get to look at policies. Let's understand what gets us out of this F grade. Let's learn from other cities that have an A, other countries that are working with us, so that this reality can change. As it says in the resolution, trafficking is also known as modern day slavery. And that cannot be tolerated. So for your advocacy, Councilor Perry, the organizations that are here, I thank you for raising the consciousness of Angelinos. And hopefully all of you who are here, all the persons being acknowledged as Pioneer Women of the Year, that you can take this on as a message to all the social networks that you're involved in throughout the city. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, Mr. President. When Chris Kelly approached uh, me and um, wanted my support of Proposition 35, for me it was a no-brainer, colleagues. Um, I have seen as a police officer working at the uh, LAPD for almost 15 years a blessed, rewarding career. 
I, I saw so many heart-wrenching stories um, that time from time came across. I have read numerous crime reports dealing with sexual abuse, but none hit me as hard as unsettling and encountering young women who were forced into prostitution. And I'll never forget when I got that radio call of a 15-year-old working the streets in Wilmington by way of Henderson, Nevada. And uh, we had to take her to, um, to the valley at uh, um, Children, Children of the Night, which was a, uh, it's a great resource. Uh, um, and and that, that 40 minute drive from the harbor to the valley, I'll never forget her sharing the stories of how much of a emotional, physical impact this thug, this pimp had on her. And to stand before you uh, to support this proposition, we all need to vote yes on Proposition 35 this November 6. And I want to, um, you know, I want to say to this um, that I'll never, I'll never imagine me quoting Ashton Kutcher uh, here in, in, on the city council floor, but uh, to echo the message of this viral photo campaign he started last year with Demi Moore, he, he put up this, this sign that's all over the internet. Uh, real men don't buy girls. And we are sending a clear message that we are putting up and letting folks know these, these, these thugs that we will not put up with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Mr. Zein. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's interesting. The City of the Angels, Los Angeles, City of the Angels. You would not think that we'd have to tolerate this in the City of the Angels or in the State of California, the Golden State of California. But it does exist. Like my colleagues who served in law enforcement, working vice, the LAPD, seeing the tragedies that have occurred over and over and over, and hearing the comments from the brave people that came up and gave their comments. When I look at this, California's Against Sexually Exploitation Act ballot initiative, you'd have to lose your conscience if you don't want to support this. It's common sense, it's reasonable, and we should support this wholeheartedly. But let me caution you on this. Proposition 109 realignment means that people who are incarcerated are being released because of lack of funding in the state of California. And when I look at strength and penalties against human traffickers and protect sexually exploited children, we need to do that. We need to put the funds in there to take these people away from civilized society so they don't have more victims. And I've seen the victims in the past, and I've gone through those tragedies. So this is something that we obviously need to support but we need to make sure that we protect the innocent and those that are guilty have the consequences and we don't just release them back into society as a revolving door with Proposition 109 is done when people are coming out of state prison at an alarming rate. So we support this. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. It's something that Hollywood has had a problem with for many years. Uh, we're making that transition, but law enforcement needs to be sensitive to it. You've got a number of members of the city council who come from law enforcement, so we're sensitive to those tragedies, those victims, and those perpetrators need to understand their consequences and very severe consequences. So the City of the Angels needs to reflect that. We need to treat everyone in the proper fashion. And this measure, you have my total undying support. Thank you very much. Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. President, and again, thank you to the council members and organizations that made this possible. It was good to see uh, a few of my friends here uh, testifying on this. Uh, I think this is critical, and it's, it's particularly critical because most people aren't aware of it. When some of the organizations started to come forward a few years ago and bring human trafficking to, to greater awareness, uh, I really had no idea about it because I didn't know that it was, it was taking place. I wasn't looking for it. But there are people not only being sexually trafficked, there are people in factories, there are people working in people's homes that you may just think are, are uh, a paid employee, but they're actually someone that's, that's uh, gotten there and been enslaved. Um, there are thousands of people who are trafficked in Los Angeles, and I think not just increasing the penalties, which is important. And I should say it's also difficult at the state level because there are many people that believe that increasing penalties for any crime is a bad idea in the legislature. Um, I was on the Public Safety Committee in the State Assembly. I was actually thrown off that committee for voting to increase penalties on a few things that are totally logical, something like this. 
Um, it needs to happen, but the greater thing that needs to happen is education. There needs to be awareness. People need to know that trafficking is occurring in Los Angeles and to look for it. And if something seems strange, to keep your eye out for it. I think getting the word out is just as important as actually changing the penalties. So I thank all of you for, for being here, for working on this issue. Uh, it is one of the most tragic things that happen in L.A., but it happens out of most people's view, and we have to increase the visibility and understanding of this issue. Yeah, Mr. Koretz, would you clarify that it wasn't me, that it was not me who threw you off that committee? <laughs> Ms. Perry, to close. And uh, thank you again to uh, my colleagues who joined me this morning, Mr. Cardenas and Mr. Parks, Mr. Buscaino and Mr. Uh, Labange. Uh, Mr. Cardenas goes way back on this issue from the State Assembly. By supporting the CASE Act, Los Angeles will join cities across California from San Diego to Oakland in making it clear that we as a state want tougher laws against sexual exploitation. So as council members hopefully join me today in support of the CASE Act, I believe that we will finally send a very strong, bold, and consistent message that Los Angeles supports any and all efforts to stop human trafficking. And I thank the coalition and all of its members for making the effort to come out here today and to spread the message of the importance of this and how it affects all of our families up and down the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Perry. And Mr. Labonge wanted me to say that, yes, LaBonge is yes on 35. Okay. With that said, Madam Clerk, let's prepare to vote on this item. Would you please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote? 14 ayes. Congratulations. That uh, item has just moved through the council. Before I call on Mr. Cardness, we have some phenomenal women that are here today. Members, if your Woman of the Year is here, if they could please come and uh, stand by your side. If you could please go get your, or the Women of the Year, please come forward and stand at the desks. Come, Mr. Cardenas, you wanted them to stand at the desk with the members, right? So Mr. Kikorian, Koretz. Cooper Koretz, everybody go get your Ro Rosendahl's Woman of the Year. Councilmember Rosendahl's honoree will be honored uh, and by Councilmember Labange. Okay, that's okay. fine. So she'll stand next to Labange. That's fine. I know that this was a very special uh, celebration for Mr. Rosendahl, and I know his uh, thoughts are with us today. So, members, if you could get your Woman of the Year, I, I've got mine. I've got mine. I've got mine at my side. So, if the, all of the Women of the, the Year, okay, Mr. Mr. Uh, Zine, are we good? If we could keep it down. Shh. And Mr. Cardenas, I'm, I'm assuming you have, I see some com commissioners behind you as well. Correct. Uh, okay, so now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could direct your attention to Mr. Tony Cardenas. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my honor to uh, uh, sponsor the Pioneer Woman of the Year on behalf of the City Council. And uh, we're very, very fortunate to have wonderful, beautiful constituents in every single one of our district. But today is the opportunity for us to honor a, a woman that we're singling out uh, because of the wonderful work and the heart and soul that, that each one of you put into your community, our community of Los Angeles. And uh, because uh, Council, Member Lebon, uh, uh, Council Member Zine is excused to leave early today, actually he was allowed to leave before this moment, we're going to go to him first and then we're going to go in numerical order after that. Council Member Zine. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, to all the 
Pioneer Women, congratulations to all of you. And I'm very honored to have Nancy Sweeney with me as the Pioneer Women from District Number 3. Uh, Nancy Sweeney, a resident of Reseda, raised in the San Fernando Valley. She went to school with uh, Councilmember Alarcon, St. Genevieve, if you remember way back then. <laughs> That's her. Volunteering during high school, she was a candy striper at the local hospital. Uh, she went into banking, left the industry to become vice president and controller, and she's now principal in a large business in the San Fernando Valley. Her skills were tested in Reseda, where she resides with her husband, Walt, and her mom and dad are here, Chuck and Eve. I want to acknowledge them also in the audience today to see their daughter who has succeeded in not only volunteering in many arenas in the San Fernando Valley, but she formed an organization, Revitalize Reseda, in 2007, and it was designed to help revitalized Reseda. She worked with the CRA, worked with the community, did food drives, worked to help people in need, did community cleanups, galvanized people from the community to come together to inspire, to motivate, and to make a difference. And she has definitely made a difference. Uh, she didn't wait for the money to arrive. She just, money out of her pocket, her husband's pocket, to make it happen. And she joined my posse, which was an activity in the community to help revitalize the community she has been an inspiration to so many people in the Reseda area to revitalize a community that used to be the hub of the San Fernando Valley that's gone through many challenges, and she has not given up that fight, has not given up that battle. So it's with great pleasure that we honor you. Smile. Come on, Nancy Sweeney. For the Pioneer Women from Council District 3, and again, for your mom and dad to be here to see this acknowledgement, I know it's very special for them, your husband Walt, to see the acknowledgement. So we've got a beautiful bouquet and we've got the resolution, Pioneer Women, Council District 3. And you think about 15 council members, each of us has the opportunity to select one person out of our entire population. Four million people in the city, and out of four million people, those that are women, there are 15 that get this honor, Pioneer Women. So it's a very, very special honor that we do once a year. And it's my pleasure, Nancy Sweeney, to honor you as the Pioneer Women for 2012 for Council District 3. God bless you, and thank you very much. Ne Ne Next, Mr. President, we'll go to Council District 1, uh, Council Member Reyes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cardenas, and I uh, congratulate all the Pioneer women. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I have a very, very strong sense of, of gratification to have been able to introduce 11 women throughout my careers as Pioneer. As my last summer's Council Member, I have the distinct pleasure to recognize Martha Benedict. And it goes back almost 20 years as an activist and working with Martha, uh, watching her advocate for the community in many different arenas, as we're building the Gold Line, as we're advocating for the Southwest Museum. She is a resident of Montecito Heights, is president of the Neighborhood Council, but has been very active in, as a photographer and taking pictures of momentous occasions and what I like to call the district of the original suburbs, the oldest communities in the city of LA. But I also know that she's been very focused on education and she just emphasized to me, let's talk about the Audubon Center in Debs Park. As an advisory board member, the Audubon Center is the first urban center in the country. It's situated in Debs Park right along the Royal Seco Parkway. It is there to train and introduce the concept of environmentalism, knowing how to nurture ourselves, taking care of our earth, understanding the flora and fauna, looking at all the birds in this great city, but more importantly, closing that gap. Because as we see the state take away our monies from our educational systems from our CRA programs. There's these huge chasms of educational opportunities. And Martha Benedict has been able to work with many volunteers in making sure that we have the ability to have our children understand how special our earth is and how we are integral in that whole life system. So Martha, I want to present to you these roses for all of your loving care for our communities. And it's a strong, strong sense of gratitude. I say muchas gracias. 
Thank you, Martha. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Next, we go to Council Member Krikorian of District 2. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas, and thank you uh, to the Commission on the Status of Women for bringing us together to recognize these extraordinary women again this year. Um, every time we do this, it's an opportunity to recognize 15 uh, really significant individuals who are making a difference in our city. Uh, but it's also an opportunity for us to hear uh, the stories that come from throughout our city about how people are making a difference and how women are playing such an important role in shaping the history uh, and the future of our city. So uh, I'm very pleased to be able to recognize um, somebody who is making an enormous difference in the San Fernando Valley, uh, Jean Sinatra. And we all know that the Los Angeles Police Department uh, has been bringing crime down each and every year. Uh, for the last five or six years at least. Uh, and we know that they're doing that at a time when we have one of the smallest police forces per capita of any big city in America. And crime is coming down, yes, because of the extraordinary professionalism and heroism and dedication of our police department. But we know that with a, a department that is small compared to most, they couldn't do that without the contribution of citizen leaders, people like Gene Sinatra, who makes such a difference in extending the ability of the police department to keep us safe. But, but I want to recognize Gene beyond that, beyond the work that she does as a leader of our CPAB, a leader of our uh, uh, community police council, a leader of our, uh, the Greater Valley Glen Neighborhood Council. Beyond that, it's not just keeping us safe today through her work in support of the police department that's so important. It's also, to me, um, the work that she's done in helping to divert young people from crime for the future and keeping us safe for generations to come. And Jean has done that through her uh, close work with the Van Nuys uh, Division in uh, creating and, and supporting the Jeopardy program, a program that provides parenting and tutoring and counsel, parenting uh, training, uh, tutoring, counseling, field trips, a boxing program, uh, also with our teen CPAB, uh, our cadets program, and uh, the Juvenile Impact Program, all of which Jean has worked hand in hand with the Van Nuys Police Division uh, in order to, to try to divert these young people uh, who are at risk of falling into the wrong life, of actually giving them the support they need and the tools they need to build a positive life for themselves and by doing that to improve life for our entire community. And so for all that she's done to help at-risk youth, for all that she's done to help our police department, for all that she's done uh, to, to help our entire community, uh, I'm very pleased to, to recognize Jean Sinatra as the Council District 2 Pioneer Woman of the Year. Jean. Mr. Mr. Krikorian, Mr. Krikorian, Sir. I've had a couple of members approach me saying that you haven't answered the question that's on everybody's mind, and she gets it. I, I, I'm not sure what question that would be, sir. <laughs> Sinatra? <laughs> In please, relation? please tell us. It, it's, uh, it's a question that I'm not able to answer at this time. Sir. Okay. <laughs> On specific instructions for my honoree, I'm not able to answer. Okay, that. thank you. Let's give her another round of applause. When you get that kind of political answer, I mean, then we really know what the answer is. S Mr. Sounded, Cardenas. Sounded more like a lawyer. It's <laughs> <laughs> my he, client advice. Um, Next, we will go to uh, Council Member Tom LeBond, who has the honor of uh, presenting two uh, Pioneer Women of the Year, as our colleague uh, Bill Rosendahl, that we all pray will be sitting with us very, very soon, uh, as our prayers are with him. Uh, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, give Mr. Cardis a big hand right now for his leadership right here. And let's give a big, big shout out and a hand to Bill Rosendahl, who's watching in TV land right there. You're a great councilman. <laughs> Hattis Koppel, right here, a committed soul who was born in Germany, war-torn Germany, uh, and uh, grew up in Germany, had to uh, escape some of the uh, trials and tribulations of post-war period. But through her life, she has always been engaged, and always been engaged, a pilot, no less, uh, in her days, 
uh, where she was one of the first female pilots of all, Amelia Earhart of sort, in the post-war uh, time. As a pioneer woman, though, Mr. Rosendahl saw her truly as a saint for the Pacific Palisades area, involved with many good things, involved with the International Red Cross and the Red Cross itself, and also in the Police Community Council and all the good things that one needs to do in a neighborhood. Also, I know she's involved in the Los Angeles Berlin sister city many years ago with the late yeah. great mayor Tom Bradley and Rudy Freer and all the Absolutely. old fellows. And her husband, Kurt Toppel, is here. Stand up, Kurt. Get a little love. And her son, where's Kurt? Where you can't miss her son. Here's her son. <laughs> Turn around for everybody. I missed him because he was kneeling down. Kurt, there are two big Kurt's in her life. So on this day, we salute you as the pioneer woman on behalf of the great councilman. Bill Rosendahl, and he would say, great, great, great for being the pioneer woman of the 11th District. These flowers for you and all that you've done, and we salute your family for the time away. Give Hottest Topple a big hand for Pioneer Woman of the Year, 11th District. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tom, we'll uh, give Tom an opportunity to regroup and then we'll go first to Council Member Koretz and then back to Council Member Labonte. Well, thank you, Mr. Cartnes, and thank you again for your great work in helping pull this together. Um, most of us marveled as uh, Britain's Queen Elizabeth celebrated her Diamond Jubilee earlier this year. Um, it's hard to believe that she's been ruling for so many years. Well, we in the 5th District are about to begin our own Diamond Jubilee celebration for our Pioneer Woman of the Year, the unsinkable Sandy Brown. <laughs> Many of you here in City Hall know Sandy. In fact, I'd wager some of you have worked with her or even tussled with her at some point, going back to her days uh, running Senator Tom Hayden's elected life uh, or her decades-long reign in Westwood as one of the founders of the Friends of Westwood and as the president of the Homeby Westwood Property Owners Association. Sandy works every day to keep this city honest in its dealings with development. She works every day to keep her beloved Westwood livable and to keep this great city more livable. And contrary to what some might think that have worked with her, Sandy does not just come to City Hall to say no. In my experience, she's a problem solver. And she comes to a ZA hearing or to City Hall to say yes, but with some suggested improvements, and she's almost always right. And as, as, as a citizen activist, she is and remains a pioneer, and I'm proud to call her my friend, proud of her great work, and uh, all that she does for Westwood and beyond. Thank so thank you, Sandy, for everything you do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, and congratulations. Um, I want to make sure Tom LaBange is ready for his presentation. Tom LaBange. Well, my microphone around and welcome. And let me get on the other side so you get a better view of Hey Pin and Hey Pin. You stand up right here. Give her a big hand. Pioneer woman, 4th District, City of Los Angeles. And how we got to know each other well is in the community. In the community, she's so passionate about affairs of all people, but especially the Korean American community. And as you know, uh, this year, we recognize the 20th anniversary of the tragedy of the 1992 riots in Los Angeles. Hey Pin had her ability to bring people together, to focus on the issues, to be able to see where we've been and where we're going and where we can go. She's an absolutely wonderful person, born and raised in Los Angeles, has a great care for all people, but truly is tough is tough. And when you use the word pioneer, you think of the pioneers who came across this country. She did not take no for an answer any time that I ever engaged with her. And on one Sunday this last spring, it was somewhat heated. We were in the Olympic Auditorium, uh, which is now a Korean church down on 18th and Grand. And she was holding everything up together to bring all the community together to reflect and comment on the issues of the day. So, hey, Pitt, I just think you're a tremendous person. My high school coach, Bill Davis, said, pick your friends you walk down a dark alley with. Hey, Pitt is one of those people you know you're going to get through that dark alley and get to success. So on behalf of the people of the 4th District, 
And I, and I really want to salute you, Hey Pitt, with these wonderful bouquet and this commendation with the great seal of Los Angeles signed by all members that salute you as the Pioneer Women of the Year 2012. Thank you, Hey Pitt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Next, we'll go to Council District 7, uh, Council Member Alarcon. Council members, <laughs> Council members, it is uh, a distinct pleasure to, first of all, have all these great women here. Uh, we need more women to actually serve on the City Council, I can tell you that. Uh, so, and there's two of them right there. Um, I, I have a, 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 a great leader of Los Angeles, somebody who is not a household name, somebody who is not uh, well known uh, publicly, uh, but who has had a tremendous indelible, uh, has made a tremendous indelible mark on Los Angeles. Uh, I'm speaking of uh, Soledad, or, or those of us who know her well know her as Chole Alatore, uh, who was born. She, <laughs> she was born in El Montesillo, uh, San Luis Potosi, Me Mexico in 1927. Uh, came to the United States uh, with her husband and children uh, when she was about 20, in her mid-20s. Uh, but she brought with her a history of, of activism that emerged from her father's uh, position as an officer in Mexico on the Railroad Mechanic Workers Union. Uh, Chole has, uh, bar none, been one of the most consistent and loud activists for civil rights, human rights, and social justice, not only in Los Angeles, certainly not just in my district, but throughout the United States of America, and has stood with some of the greatest leaders of our time. She uh, certainly learned from her father about the sufferings of the working poor, but also experienced this as a worker in the United States of America, where she experienced anti-Mexican discrimination firsthand by her supervisors at one company and another, where she was fired for her support of union activities. Uh, but she is a long-standing activist who has created organizations and managed organizations uh, and has been affiliated with the Teamsters, the Maritime Union, the United Auto Workers, and the United Farm Workers. But she is most known for her work in fighting for immigrant rights. Indeed, Los Angeles would not be the same today if it were not for her activities. Uh, she became a prominent activist in the Chicano Civil Rights Movement and helped establish the Mexican-American Political Association, Hermandad Mexicana Nacional, and in 1968-69, she worked with the National Maritime Workers Union and initiated union organizing drives amongst immigrant workers. She, uh, along with Bert Corona, who now has a school named after him, uh, she founded the organization El Centro de Acción Social Autonoma, Hermandad General de Trabajadores, uh, otherwise known as CASA, a seminal Chicano political organization which from its inception had strong working class and trade union orientation. No doubt this woman has tremendous courage. She was surrounded by leading figures in the movement uh, such as Bert Corona, Maria Elena Durazo, Mayor Villaraigosa, uh, and played a vital role in, uh, advocating on behalf of immigrant workers' rights issues, including legal assistance, social policy advocacy, and education. Uh, she was responsible for CASA's administration and maintained a behind-the-scenes profile in, in the uh, Chicano Latino communities of Greater Los Angeles and supported the campaigns for president of Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, Mayor Tom Bradley, and all the other greats. <laughs> to this day, Chole remains politically active and takes great pri pride and joy in the work she has carried out and describes it as a beautiful struggle. Um, I've known her well. In fact, as a teenager, uh, I, I uh, picketed side by side with her uh, at a car dealership that was ripping off its workers uh, when I was just 18 or 19 years old. Uh, she uh, uh, is a very important part of the lives of immigrants 
in America, whether they know her or not, because she is one of the true champions that changed the laws and, more importantly, changed our attitude towards immigrants, particularly here in Los Angeles. Uh, she fondly recalls the first time that undocumented immigrants went to Washington, D.C. to lobby congressional representatives for amnesty, as well as the first march by undocumented workers in L.A., where approximately 10,000 people showed up to march down Broadway. These are not acts of, of, of a, a humble person. These are acts of somebody who is courageous and empowered, though, by righteousness and human rights. So she uh, fought against Prop 187. I'm so proud that she lives in, in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Um, in fact, uh, as a result of her organization, my stepmother was naturalized in this country. And she, that organization is responsible for literally tens of thousands of people who are now United States citizens uh, productively continuing their daily lives. So with that, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, to select uh, Chole Alatore as the recipient of the 2012 Council District 7 Pioneer Woman Award. And it's my pleasure to present her with this certificate of gratitude signed by the entire city council. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Next, we'll go to Council District 8, uh, Council Member Parks. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to uh, introduce you to a young lady I've known since about 1978. And she has been a pioneer since then when she started her Sheen Way School uh, in 1971 with her father, uh, a young man that uh, served about 40 years in the medical profession, both in Texas and in Los Angeles. Uh, with that uh, Sheen Way School, uh, she has brought forth education throughout the South Los Angeles area. Uh, she also took on the task that she actually went to Ghana, built a school in the village of her great-great-grandmother uh, to continue that education uh, within another country. Uh, she has been a person that's been on the forefront of education, particularly looking at issues from a medical perspective. Uh, she recently uh, expanded that issue of education by joining with the Alliance Charter School, in which she now has a working relationship with a charter school on her property, where she continues to run her Sheen Way operation. And so I, I'd like to introduce you to Dolores Sheen, who has been a pioneer uh, in the city of Los Angeles for the last 30 to 40 years. And so thank you very much. I'd like to also... I'm going to present this to you in honor of your uh, being de uh, designated as the 8th District Pioneer Woman of the Year. Okay. Why don't you look over there again. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Council President will go to Council Member Perry, District 9. Thank you very much. I'm standing next to a very special woman who is special to me as a friend, but she is a tremendous human being, a community advocate, and uh, she's so well loved. She's joined here today by Miriam Marita and uh, Ana Leon, two of her neighbors. Mrs. Mendez, or Gloria Mendez, is my pioneer woman of the year from the 9th Council District. She came from Cuba many years ago. She and her husband Emilio worked for many years and saved up enough money to buy a house at 25th and Griffith in the early 1970s and they've been in this house for over 40 years. And they've always taken pride in making sure that their neighborhood is clean and safe. In many ways Mrs. Mendez reminds me of Golda Meir, former Prime Minister of Israel, who wielded great power uh, from her kitchen table over food, bringing people together. Well, Mrs. Mendez is the same. It's a privilege to be invited into her home and to partake of her food, 
but you better beware because Mrs. Mendez always gets what she wants. <laughs> and no one ever says no to her. And she does it with charisma, she does it with charm, and an intensity that is fueled by her great personal faith in God and her religious beliefs, which enable her to focus each and every day and to be tenacious and to do it with great love and great passion and never malice and always on behalf of everyone else but herself, but for the betterment of her community. So she is an important and very powerful voice for our community. I want to thank her publicly for her commitment to community interests and to improving South Los Angeles for everyone who calls the community home. She is so influential that she told me that her pastor was coming by her house one day. Now, she is a member of a Second Baptist Church, and if you know who her, who her pastor is, his name is Dr. William Epps. Dr. Epps is internationally recognized and a highly regarded biblical scholar and preacher, pastor. And I, I had to smile when he came walking down the street in his tracksuit and a sun hat from the church to visit with Mrs. Mendez. That's how powerful she is. And if you ever need to find her on a Sunday morning, I think the 10 o'clock service, all you need to do is go to Second Baptist Church on the right side of the room, and there she sits. She exemplifies the trailblazing spirit of a true city of Los Angeles pioneer woman, and I feel very blessed to have her in my life, and I know the people of the 9th District have benefited greatly from the passionate work that she has done. So may God continue to bless you. Thank you to the Commission on the Status of Women, for you have blessed us with your presence. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mendez. Oh, yes, I have a certificate for you. Congratulations. Um, okay. Next, we go to our Council President, Council District Number 10 Representative, uh, Herb Wesson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cardness. Now, before I briefly introduce my Woman of the Year, I see that we have some commissioners here from the uh, commission and some staff. Could you guys please stand up? Stand up. Would you please give these young ladies a round of applause? You don't know how hard they had to work to hustle the, the money to put this well-deserved uh, program together. Uh, they've been around for a long time. I've had the opportunity to meet with them in my office. I'm, I'm one of their biggest, in fact, I think you have 15 biggest fans. So anyway, I just wanted to applaud you. Now, the young lady that, that I uh, recognize today shares the name of one of the members of this council. She was born in El Salvador left to come to this country at age nine. She married her childhood sweetheart that she met in the fifth grade. Somebody, maybe they should have kept an eye on you, I tell you, fifth grade. <laughs> and uh, she came to this country. She is known today as the godmother of El Salvador. She has volunteered her entire adult life to help El, Salv El Salvadorians and anyone else in need. All you have to do is go to Isabel Cardenas and she would never refuse you. She has helped multi-ethnic groups of folk, you name it, she's done it, from helping people become citizens to helping them fill out uh, their, their papers and a variety of other things with a strong emphasis on bringing us all together, that we all have the same goals, we all have the same needs, we all have the same desires. She is a mother of three, a grandmother of eight, and she focuses a lot of her time on mentoring young men and young women. So it is my honor 
and my pleasure to present to this city council the godmother of El Salvador, Isabel Cardenas, who, as you can see, Mr. Cardenas, we're just chilling. That's why we're seated. Okay, <laughs> we're just chilling. But as you can see, she has her bouquet, and then also, I will be presenting her with a lovely certificate from the city of Los Angeles. And if we could get somebody to help her take this to her vehicle, because this certificate is bigger than she and I. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, give her another round of applause. She's been a great supporter of mine, and I love her, and, and, and know Mr. LaBange. Thank you. Thank you, we Council. don't want to start. Okay, Tom. She's Can not anymore. She's not in anymore. <laughs> She's good. I love her. I had to stand for her and the whole family. Great job, for Isabel. All right. She's mine, Tom. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As you can see, uh, Council Member Garcetti is kissing the ring of Isabel Cardenas right now. She's not on camera, but that's what he just did. Um, but at this time, uh, Mr. President, we have Araceli Campos, President of the Commission on the Status of Women, and I think it would be appropriate at this moment in time for us to go to her so she can say a few words about what this means to, not only to the Commission but the City of Los Angeles. And this year, it's a little bit special in the sense that the Commission has brought forward uh, some honorees of, of their own. They were here this morning. I'm not sure if they're still here. As usual, like all of you women, very, very busy and uh, preoccupied with your community. But uh, at this time, we have we want to give the floor to Araceli Campos, President of the Commission on the Status of Women. Araceli, it's good to see you. What was that? I said it's good to see you. Good to see you again, too. You're my council member. <laughs> the council member, council president, Weston council member, Gardenas, thank you for that introduction. Count, city council, thank you for your partnership on behalf of the Commission on the Status of Women. We are thrilled to celebrate with you this year's 24th annual Pioneer Women of the Year Awards. Um, as you may know, this is the CSW's 37th year in existence, and last year was our coming back party after um, having to go on hiatus with this amazing event. Um, the year before. So thank you for rejoining in this celebration. Um, I would like to introduce um, to you our, my fellow commissioners. We have our immediate past president, um, Dr. Franciol Roussan Wilson. <laughs> we have to my left, Commissioner Liliana Perez. <laughs> Next to her, we have Commissioner Helen Hahn. On my far right, we have Commissioner Jan Whetstone, our newest commissioner. And in the purple dress, we have the amazing Farrah Parker, who is our new executive director. We want to thank you for your partnership. Truly, we cannot exist as a commission without your support, and we cannot together serve the women and girls of this great city without our combined efforts. So I want to thank you, and I, I, I truly look forward to continuing our work together in the coming year, and I hope that you will all uh, reach out to everyone behind behind me here today as your allies, um, because that's why we're here. We're volunteer commissioners. We're here to serve and help you further your goals with the city. Uh, today's event, the CSW honored four of our own honorees, and I just wanted to acknowledge them. Um, they were the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. They are a sister commission, the California State Commission, and they also have uh, survived and are now thriving after almost being eliminated last year and so we wanted to give them that special recognition and we had their commissioner um, uh, Holly Mitchell, uh, the Honorable Holly Mitchell accept on their behalf. Uh, we honored uh, the amazing Anita de France who as many of you know is a uh, tireless advocate for women athletes and the head of LA84 Foundation here in Los Angeles. She's still 
at the Olympics uh, advocating for women's rights. And as you know, much of the credit goes to her for making this Olympics the first Olympics where every country participating sent a woman for the first time. Um, our, yes. <laughs> That is owed to a woman from the city of L.A. Um, we also honored the Honorable Hilda Solis, Secretary of Labor. Um, we had a representative from her office, and we wanted to acknowledge her tireless support of women workers and all workers uh, throughout the U.S., uh, also an L.A. native. And um, lastly, we wanted to honor Dr. Diana Bonta, the President and CEO of the California Wellness Foundation, who is uh, dedicated her life to advancing health and wellness for all Californians and particularly for women and girls in this in this um, state and in this city. So I want to thank you again for your tremendous partnership and please know that we'll look forward to future future partnership in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Campos. Next, we'll go to the representative of Council District 12, Mitch Englander, uh, to present his honoree. Thank you, and, uh, and, and thank you, Councilman Cardenas, for doing this as well, and the commission. Shh. Can we get some, everybody to ask the sidebar conversations just to keep it down a little Please, bit? Please, out of courtesy, oh, thank you. Uh, bring down the conversations or take them outside. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. I, uh, I was looking around the horseshoe a few moments ago when we started this celebration. And all the women that are being honored were in every one of the council chairs. And I just thought for a moment, imagine if you will, that this is the makeup of the Los Angeles City Council. <laughs> right now, right now, we, we have uh, uh, unfortunately only one woman on the Los Angeles City Council and, and hopefully with the next election that will change as well. But imagine what a better place we would be today. I know that my household is better, and I live with three women, and uh, it's three to one, and uh, and so, and I'm a better person for it. But that would be great. So I just that picture, uh, moments ago, was fantastic, and uh, and I can see that in the very, very, very near future. And it's an honor. I said this upstairs earlier, uh, for me to not only have the honor of having my honoree. We have a bet on how many times I can say honor in a speech. Um, <laughs> be a friend and somebody that I've actually worked with and known, uh, which has been fantastic, but a woman who has been a true inspiration for many others, and not just women, but youth and at-risk youth and those in need and those most vulnerable in the community who has done so much, not only in the nonprofits, but a woman who has actually taken the, gra the glass ceiling and kept it and recycled and reused it and started a company in 1973, which is thriving today, called Ultra Glass. And she takes that recycled glass and makes incredible glass sculptures where you've seen these ceilings made out of glass in Las Vegas, where you've seen the whole storefront at the Godiva headquarters made out of recycled glass, as Jane Skeeter, who has done this incredibly um, beautiful artwork and employed dozens of people here locally in the community uh, to do these countertops and all kinds of other wonderful so go Google ultra glass if you're in the market for recycling though no. um, but in addition to that and then let me just give you a little bit of of this incredible biography by this amazing woman uh, Jane is also a licensed general contractor and if you can imagine I think you could probably count on one hand going back in the day when she started this company in 1973 imagine a general contractor a woman with a pink hard hat showing up at a job site there weren't a lot of those going on. Right now we got HGTV and you might see one or two, but this is the real person that started it right here. Uh, she's also a certified interior designer and glazing contractor, holds a California lifetime teaching credential, has taught courses in all types of uh, contracting, stained glass, creative design, rug making, you name it. She's uh, a sought off after lecturer. Graduated UCLA's Management Development and Entrepreneurs Program the National Association of Women Business Owners, LA Peak Leadership Academy, and as a U.S. Green Building Council Leadership in Energy Environmental Design, a lead accredited professional. But uh, wait, there's, there's more. <laughs> she is highly regarded, currently sits on the advisory boards of Woodbury University School of Business. Pro-America Bank is an active member, active member 
of the boards of the Valley Economic Alliance, the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, ValPAC, the Boys and Girls Club of the West Valley, the Valley Group, Valley Green Team, the National Association of Women Business Owners, LA Foundation, and so many, and this list just keeps going on and on for pages. It's incredible. Um, there's not enough time in the day. This is Superwoman right here that I'm honoring. Uh, she's also been recognized uh, by the National Association of Women Business Owners, LA National Association of Women Business Owners, as well as San Fernando Valley Business Journal's Women of Business CEO of the Year, Businesswoman of the Decade, LA SBA's Women in Business Champion of the Year, NABO Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo National Trailblazers Award, two Crystal Achievement Awards, from the National Association of Glass, the Best of Boutique Award from Hospitality Design Magazine. This goes on and on and on. This, it, it's incredible. And what a great friend and a true honor for me uh, to have my pioneer woman be a friend that I've worked with that um, is a true inspiration to all of us. Uh, and it is just remarkable that she's done all of these achievements. And she's only 19 years old, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So I would like to present her these flowers and also a wonderful uh, accommodation. And thank you, a resolution from the council. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas, again for doing this. Really appreciate it. Congratulations, Jane. Next, we go to Council District 13, Council Member Garcetti. Thank you so much. I was just joking with Councilmember Englander. I was going to give a speech, but he took all my time. Um, but that said, <laughs> it is really wonderful to be here with so many incredible women. And um, I've worked with many of them. Um, Councilmember Labonge is a pioneer woman, was our pioneer woman two years ago. And I joked upstairs, she's probably the first. Papin is the first to win twice. Um, but I have the most extraordinary human being and woman who is here today. Um, the pioneer woman from the 13th Council District, a woman who has brought joy, movement, culture, history to our district, to our city, and to our world, Irma Becerra Nunez. Please. And just at the start of things, because they've been so patient, I think they're all standing, but everybody who's come here for Irma, stand up, stand up. Look at, look at that. That is just incredible. Family, friends, students, so many of our beloved seniors from Glassell Park who have benefited because Irma is widely known in Glassell Park and Northeast Los Angeles as the physical fitness instructor at the Glassell Park Senior and Community Center, which we got built a few years ago. But it's great to get a building built, but it means nothing if you don't have great programming in it. And we don't have good programming if we don't have an extraordinary human being. She has taught for the past five and a half years yoga, qigong, tai chi, line dancing, and salsa. And she has brought the power of movement to seniors, many of whom I've talked to, who said, before I had these classes of Irma, I had pains in my back, in my hip, in my legs. Now being able to do this, I feel like I can face the world without that pain. I can actually embrace it and move a little bit, feel a little bit of the music. And I've had the joy of being able to dance with many of these seniors. And they cut quite a rug, I got to say. <laughs> Her love of dance began when she was four years old when she learned Spanish classical dance at a recreation center in her home in City Terrace. So she is starting the next generation being, being able to do what she did as a young girl. Later, her Girl Scout troop leader noticed her talent, encouraged her along, and by age 14, she was teaching dance, not just performing. Performing as a professional dancer, she earned a scholarship to participate in UCLA's modern dance program for the highly gifted secondary students. And I, as I mentioned upstairs, you name the genre, she's danced it. Whether it's line dancing, jazz, Polynesian, Israeli, Vietnamese, African, ballet folklorico, tap, ma, um, ballet, she has done it all. And she's done this alongside with her great partner and husband, Juan Johnny Gonzalez. And together they've developed, yeah, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Behind every pioneering woman is a good man. And they have brought initiatives to teach art and culture. They have a multimedia stage production called New Barrio Lifestyle Campaign, which combines song, dance, storytelling, and more to provide a history of the Chicano, Mexican, Latino experience. She's a strong community advocate, and she credits her mother, Hortensia, for instilling in her a deep respect for activism to bring about community change. And she was recently a great fighter to protect adult ed. We were there, said, and thank you to all of the students who came. 
But I just want to say the world is a better place because of Irma Becerra Nunez, and we are so proud to honor you as the 13th Council District Pioneer Woman of the Year. Give her a round of applause. Okay. the next class? <laughs> and the next the next class will be uh, Monday. On Monday, at what 12, time? Twelve thirty to five. Twelve thirty to five. Come and by then, Glassell and Park. And six uh, fifteen to uh, uh, nine at Yosemite Rec Center. And at Yosemite at six fifteen to nine. So come on by, <laughs> and and wiggle your hips a little bit. That's right. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to uh, thank Councilman Garcetti. Uh, and Irma for all your uh, hard work. Uh, 11, 12 years ago, the class of Park was in District 1. Uh, it's come back to District 1, and you left it in, in a great, great shape, Councilman Garcetti. What well, a wonderful constituency, and congratulations to all of you. Just mentioned that Irma was his teacher. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Talk in the mic. No, I just thought it's because you were a senior and you Talk took some of her, mic, her dance classes. No, what, what did she do? <laughs> anyway, she's had a big. Oh, she was a teacher in his district. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> got it. I right, glad we got that straightened out. Everything was going fine until. No. Next, we go to Council District 14. Our Council Member we said. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas and uh, Irma. Since you also do a class in Yosemite Park in my district, I'm gonna go take some classes as well and uh, go there. And but, uh, Mr. President, uh, I'd like to motion at this time that all the honorees get to choose one item on the agenda today and vote on that item for each council member. What do you think? Is that allowed? <laughs> no. No, it's not allowed. Are you a, but, trend, are you a trendsetter? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to present to the City of Los Angeles the Pioneer Woman of the Year for Council District 14, a great woman who has a huge heart who doesn't look for the limelight, but is always there working to make the city of Los Angeles better and her beloved community of Herman better, Wendy Reiser. She was born and raised in Herman, and she began her journey in helping the community with a triad of issues, particularly cleaning, greening, and providing more safety for her community through the establishment of the Herman Advance Team. And this team has done so much to improve the quality of life in Herman, a beautiful community in Northeast Los Angeles. They've cleaned up streets, they've spearheaded getting hundreds of trees planted in parkways, medians, hillsides, and home gardens. And as much trouble we have at times with Caltrans to make sure they clean up those off-ramps and on-ramps, they've been successful at Herman making sure those off-ramps and on-ramps are clean to make sure as people leave and come to the beautiful community of Herman, they keep that beauty that we see in all of Herman. They've also uh, gone on to uh, protect the community by fighting off large developers who wanted to build large developments in the community and instead put things like schools in those beautiful areas and provided funding to the local school where it's been a better place because of people like Wendy who go out there and beautify Herman. I can't say enough about Wendy. I drive by sometimes and see her clean up the community. Uh, it was great to see as this past year where Herman celebrated its 100th year anniversary that Wendy uh, collaborated with others and had a beautiful celebration to recognize the past, present, and future of this beautiful community. What I like most is that she sends out a weekly newsletter that's called Local, uh, it's called All Things Herman, and it kind of sums up everything that's happening in Herman. She writes that each and every week, and I love the way it ends because it really not only speaks to Wendy's personality, but it also speaks to what Herman is all about. And she writes, lots more fun and happy to come because it's all good in Herman, where quir quirky works, families return, and dogs sleep all night long. <laughs> Congratulations, Wendy, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for all you do from the establishment of the Herman Dog Park and everything else. You are just a beautiful human being that does so much for, you, does so much for your community. And uh, for me, it's been a great honor to work with you each and every day. Olive Herman loves you. The city of Los Angeles loves you. And I couldn't think of a better woman this year to recognize as the Pioneer Woman of the Year for Council District 14.
Congratulations, Wendy. Next, we go to uh, Council District 15 with our newest, greenest member of the Council, uh, Councilmember Buscaino. <laughs> Get close, get close. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Uh, thank you for championing this effort, and thank you to the um, Commission for um, supporting this effort and in, in celebrating our Pioneer Women of the Year here in the City of Los Angeles. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you um, my selection representing Council District 15, Janet Shower from the Great Harbor Gateway, California. With and maybe uh, next year we can start with Council District 15 first. Okay. Do I have a second? Oh. Yeah. But with her, we have 15 community members, um, and it's a, they're supporting Janet, and it's a testament to her continued love and passion to serve the great people of the city and also her community in Harbor Gateway. Janet was born in Point Marion, Pennsylvania, and moved to Los Angeles in December 1950 and selected the Harbor Gateway area to be her new home. In 1963, she graduated from Harbor College, Great Seahawk, as she is, in the nursing program and worked Torrance Memorial Hospital for 25 years until she retired in 1991. Since her retirement, she's volunteered in the Harbor Gateway community, including the Police Advisory Board, the LAPD Harbor Division. Um, in, in light of the tragic death of Cheryl Green in Harbor Gateway, she is dedicated um, to providing youth in the Harbor Gateway community a solid foundation to achieve their potential. Uh, Janet also helps distribute food to low-income families at the Boys and Girls Club and leads the Mother's Meeting, which now goes by the MAC Meeting, in honor of Mary Ann Cyphers, who I said this morning is shining down upon us. Um, and the MAC Meeting uh, was created in response to the tragic death of Cheryl Green. Uh, Janet is currently working to generate support for a park and a small community center. And uh, I have had the opportunity to work hand in hand in partnership with Janet and the Harbor Gateway community uh, with uh, my, my partner, also here, Senior Lead Officer Brian Cook. And we've done some great things when it comes to community based policing in the Harbor Gateway area. And I want to thank Janet for being on the forefront of these issues. God bless you. We love you. And thank the community who's here supporting her as well. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Back to you. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Um, as in the good things in life, it's not a race. So it's not who goes first or who goes last or what have you. It's a matter of who shows up to get the work done. And I'm very, very honored to present to all of you, Diane Hand, my Pioneer Woman of the Year for my district, Council District 6. And. I just want to say today was a very wonderful day for me. I feel very, very comfortable, surrounded by powerful, beautiful women. Uh, my wife, Norma, reminds me of that every day. But I was raised by six older sisters and my mother. My father and mother stayed together for about 50 years until his passing. But when we were at home, boy, did when the girls spoke, you did what you were told. Um, so with that, uh, today is a very fun and comfortable day for me to recognize all of you wonderful, beautiful, and powerful women. And uh, today, Diane Hand uh, is my honoree. And uh, for her tireless community activism, volunteering uh, throughout my district and beyond, Diane has been a proud resident of Arlita for nearly 40 years making this community her home after migrating from New Zealand in 1971. Diane has had several careers during her lifetime, including being a banker and then a paramedic, but it's her tremendous work with the community that we celebrate today. Diane has worked relentlessly as a volunteer for the Ar Arlita Neighborhood Council, the Dorrington Defenders Neighborhood Council Watch, the LA Mission Area Community Advisory Board, and the American Red Cross, and the list goes on and on. Most recently, Diane took the lead in raising and identifying funds for what we know as the jaws of life for our local fire station number seven in her community. This life-saving piece of equipment is valued at over $10,000, and she was able to garner the funds and get that equipment over to our fire station. But shortly thereafter, um, right there, a few, a few blocks away from where she lives, on, on the Branford off-ramp of the 5 Freeway, a driver and a passenger were 
stuck in their vehicle and firefighter used the very tool that she was able to get for them just a few days earlier to save two lives. As if this weren't enough, Diana is also regularly hosts food drives to benefit local families and she has been instrumental in the development of the East San Fernando Valley Nature Park. Diane has selflessly given of herself and continues to do so and it is for those reasons and many more that she is the honoree of the 6th District as my Pioneer Woman of the Year. And uh, we present you, Diane, with this resolution signed by every elected official in the city of Los Angeles to honor you and thank you for your tireless work. In addition to that, she does have a bouquet as well, but it's been a long day and uh, we've been moving around from upstairs and all around, so I just want to say congratulations, Diane, and thank you so much for all that you do for all of us. Okay. Let's give her a round of applause and to all of the wonderful, wonderful women that uh, we've honored today. Again, Mr. Cardenas, I know that you have done this uh, on a yearly basis, and so when you head to Washington, D.C., the other members of the council, I believe, are going to arm wrestle to see who's going to be the host of this great uh, yearly presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Council President Wesson. And again, it certainly is an honor, as we all know, when we're given the opportunity to take the lead on such a wonderful, wonderful event such as today. So thank you to all the members for all your diligence and the hard, hard decision of picking your Pioneer Woman of the Year, as we know that there are many, many wonderful people in our districts who are as well deserving as well. Thank you. Again, hats off to you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Uh Let's see. Can I get a wide shot here? I want to. <laughs> he says a real wide <laughs> shot. I want to enter some. But now let's get a close up so that we can see this handsome gentleman to my right. That will probably kiss me on my ear or neck. Or... Anyway, many moons ago, when I was in the California State Assembly, every time there was a transition to a new speaker. There was a fight. You'd had different groups fighting. Would Mr. Guys, hug him later. Because <laughs> he'll do anything to hug anybody. He's known for that. Liliana's laughing. I think. Anyway, Bob Hertzberg and I created the first smooth transition from one speaker to the other. So from the 65th speaker of the California State Assembly, I'd like to present to you the 64th speaker of the California State Assembly, my dear friend, Bob Hertzberg. In Sacramento, not only would he hug you and, and kiss me, he would pick me up and twirl me. <laughs> that was very embarrassing. And I have young Daniel, his son, da young Daniel, come over here. Can we get Daniel? Been down, Daniel. There he is. Daniel has been an intern in my office. And what we've come to the conclusion is that the Hertzberg family drinks some kind of special milk because they're all brilliant. Give young Daniel a round of applause as well. Anyway, Bobby, welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, thanks to Mr. Cardenas. We will now. Oh, I think Eric Garcetti is waiting in the wings to get a hug. We used to call him Huggy Bear. Okay, let's go back to the agenda. Thank you, Bobby. Let's go to item nine, Mr. Sachs. Arnold Sachs, are you Arnold? Are you still here? <laughs> Mr. Arnold Sachs on item nine, and Mr. Sachs is coming forward. Sorry for the delay, Mr. Sachs. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. Um, recovery day. I still have my notes from last recovery day when David Farrar and um, Michael Gagan. And the gentleman who's running for uh, controller, um, damn, Ron Galperin, were here with their um, 
suggestions regarding Recovery Day. So how many of the suggestions have you moved on that they brought forth in uh, November of uh, August of last year? You know, I also kept this article. When the city will give state firms an 8% edge when you decided to give local businesses an 8% advantage. And then the next day, you gave a contract to Arizona for $97.5 million. Oh, one was in 10 15 11, and the next one was in November 2011. And then this article program gives local businesses the advantage. LAX 5 8 12. Then the next day, 5812, LAX Board awards contract to Chicago based company for, oh, it doesn't say, $5.9 million. So your ideas for business improvement or uh, revenue day or whatever you want to call it. And just recently, I think it was two days ago, there was a story in the press telegram. Um, Long Beach to look to sell carbon credits created from the trees in the city. Why is Long Beach doing this and you guys are sitting? Whose idea? We have the best and the brightest. You have committees, you have this, you have that. Long Beach is going to sell credits for carbon. What you got? Nothing. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. There are no speakers on the queue. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could uh, open the roll on this item. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Mr. President, there's a request for that item to go forthwith. Without objection. And let's see, what do we have now? We'll go to item uh, 11. which was held special by cards. In fact, Arnold, you can just stay around you, followed by Mr. Herman. Mr. Sachs, followed by Mr. Herman. Mr. Sachs, you're up. Yes, thank you again. Um, I held this item. I believe no Notre Dame High School. That doesn't sound like a public school. It sounds more like a private school. So I'm wondering, not only private, but associated with religion. So I'm wondering about the separation of state and religion as far as funding goes here, that the city is going to be involved in a tax equity fiscal um, with, with financing acquisition or even giving money here. What about um, public schools? Does the city get involved with TEPFRA hearings for public schools? What about charter schools? Does the city get involved in tougher hearings for charter schools? We don't seem to get an answer here. It would really be enlightening to find that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herman. In fact, and, and Arno, if you and Mr. Herman would stay close, the next item is item 12. And I have cards on the both of you. Mr. Herman, please. I just want to point out that congratulations, first of all, to all the participants of the presentations for activism. Very good. I got not, not much to say on item 11, so I'm going to hold, your, hold the time and continue with business. You're up next on item 12. On this item 11, let us open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, and I also want to make a quick announcement that uh, our, our little furry animal, uh, Timmy, was adopted by, by Anna Lynn in the mayor's office. So we still have our 100% adoption uh, record. With that said, let's now go to item 12, where I have cards from Mr. Arnold Sachs and Mr. Herman on item 12. So, please come forward. 
Yes, thank you again, Arnold Sachs. Um, I'm going to discuss this item and, and the Quimby fees that are generated here. Here it mentions $56,376. And the exact use of the Quimby fees, because I believe they're supposed to be related to park orientation for uh, in the vicinity of the buildings that are being constructed for housing. Yet Quimby fees were used for the renovation around the City Hall Park that were just completed. So I was wondering why Quimby fees weren't used for the park at the City Police to pay, the new City Police building. And I'm also wondering, since essentially Quimby fees were used to create the new park on Grand Avenue right here that's right behind the um, County Board of Supervisors, why can't the city... Mr. President, he doesn't appear to be talking about this final track. We connect, track. Arno, please. Why can't the city use its influence to get the Quimby fees used up front for property to develop a park? before the building even goes into effect. Essentially, it's a win-win situation. It's even more of a win-win situation. The related has put out $50, 50 million dollars for that President, park. He's, he's still not talking about this item. And they get to keep the property that they want to develop. So if these developers who are assessed these Quimby fees develop the park first, then the public has an area to use. Okay, I don't know. Get the area for their building. It's a win-win situation. Okay, Mr. Herman, are you coming forward or are you passing on this? You had a card on item 12 as well. Okay, there are no additional speakers on the queue. If we could open the roll, close the roll tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay, Madam Clerk, what's next on the agenda? Mr. President, at this time, Council can take up um, general public comment for the regular meeting or go into the special meeting. I think we should go. We could. I didn't hear the first part. Uh, general public comment for the regular meeting or the special meeting. Okay, let's get rid of the general public comment. Veronica Sandoval. Arnold Sachs, Mr. Herman, Yvonne Mitchell Autry. Please come forward, and Arnold, you can speak next, Mr. Herman. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Veronica Sandoval. I live on 3129 Boulder. I'm here because my concern is about Armando Herman. He's my neighbor. He's been my neighbor for the past 13 years. Um, it's been really, really bad now. Um, he's been harassing me and my family and all the neighbors. Um, he threatened me. He threatened to shoot me. And I have a two-year-old, and I'm eight months pregnant. And we went to the LAPD to try to resolve this, and now I'm really afraid of my life and my baby's life. I really cannot go outside my backyard because the, it's just pure gate, and he's always there, you know, making rude comments, looking at me really, really wrong, really disrespectfully. Um, it, he throws stuff at my car. I just bought a new car. He throws things at my car. Now it's permanently damaged, my mom's car also. Um, it's been really, really, really stressful for me now that I'm pregnant. I'm scared of, of, of him and I'm scared of, of the people he brings there. He brings like alcoholics or drug addicts and they just hang around right there. I don't even like to leave my son playing outside because they're there. And I'm scared that he might give something to my son, you know, that could harm him. Um, I always lock myself in my room, in my room, close my doors, close all my windows, and still lock my room for my house because I'm scared. Um, now I'm, I'm trying to, if you guys could help us out, because it's, it's been really, really, really bad. Okay, I'll stay there for a second. Mr. Weezars, is this your district? Maybe you or 
staff person can yes. can have a discussion with her. I want to say this is the second or third time something like this was mentioned. So at least uh, whatever you think you could do, if you would do it. Uh, did he you want to say something, Mr. Weezer? He always tries to intimidate us all the time. You know? Okay, Mr. Weezer. Th well, thank you, ma'am. Well, well, myself and my staff will talk to you. Those are some serious allegations that should not be taken lightly, and so we will work with you and the LAPD. Uh, we apologize for this, but we will work with you to see what we can do. Thank you. Well, we'll meet you here on the side and talk to you there. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, if you just go over to the to the side, and congratulations on your your new baby to be. Okay, Mr. Sachs. Followed by Mr. Herman, followed by Yvonne Michelle Autry. Yes, thank you again, Arnold Sachs. Um, this is one of the articles I talked about. Um, For-profit schools may lose federal aid. This is from June 28, 2012. It mentions in this article, 12% of all students in higher education attend a for-profit institution, yet they represent 46% of all student loan dollars in default. And yet the city is in contracts and does business with Caltrans, and Caltrans allows not for profit schools to put signage up on highways that validate the schools. That doesn't make sense. Where are you acting? What are you acting? How are you acting? That being said, you know, a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago, about three or four years ago, when MLK Hospital was facing the prospect of closing, they had a couple of hearings at the County Board of Supervisors just before they were going to vote. And a crew of professional people came down to talk about how poor the area was in regards to health services and how rich it was in diabetes and, and, and heart failure and all the, the bad things that could happen. And that was with the hospital open. Then it closed. So I was wondering, because I was listening to the discussion today regarding the, the Slavery Act, and I'm thinking, well, jeepers, 16 council people here, only one of them haven't been in government, or two of them. So that means for the last 12 years, while you've been sitting in council chambers, the slavery problem in the state of California and in Los Angeles has gotten worse. How can that be? Why aren't you acting? gotten worse. And then you get people like Councilman Koretz who say, I didn't realize the problem was so bad except when I was in the legislation, I got kicked off for trying to make laws up. Which one was it? How can it be? Thank you. Um, Mr. Herman? It's a shameful situation when there's such words as harassment, slander, but when it comes down to broadcasting your reputation before everyone in Los Angeles, well, let's bring it on. It's very unfair that you have individuals who take your rights away of privacy and confidentiality when you allow your staff to speak and say things to bring people here to talk negatively towards individual activists who lives in Boyle Heights, in Boyle Heights. If I am such a outrageous freak out man, Mr. Weezar, I wouldn't come here passionately to resolve quality of life issues. I thought I had the trust of local government to protect my rights with confidentiality when there is absolute nonsense for such communication. So oral statements about a person's reputation or standing in line of the community. I represent a part of my community because I live in my community. And whatever statements a landlord brings against you and they're false, prove them. Because I'm here today to prove them. When you bring the authorities to my house and they question me, that's fine, Mr. Weezar. Hollenbach did come to my home. I was threatened on the phone by them. You better be there. You better be there, Mr. Herman. Fine, come on over. Come on over. Because I, like the rest of you, Councilman, 
You participate in legal matters in the same manner that I do. We are all for the people of Los Angeles. So again, both libel and slander are forms of defamation, and I refuse to allow my... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just, just like we uh, respect your right to come and speak, we respect the rights of others. They have the ability to come and speak what's on their mind as well. Ms. Autry? Yes, thank you again. For the record, my name is Yvonne Michelle Autry. I'm still a woman, not Mitchell. Uh, and that, that's no uh, maiden. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you so much, um, uh, Mr. Wesson. I, I'd like to speak in defense. You know, there, I think um, you're hypocrites on many levels in that, you know, the Constitution and the right to freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, has not been realized. The application, implementation, you know, of what this, this, this Constitution affords and the rights that it guarantees and protects us are constantly violated. And that not only those who choose to exercise their freedom of speech, exercise the right to assemble and organize, not only are we consistently incriminated, stigmatized, demonized, we're victims of assassination of character. I've been going through it for 20 years. It's par for the course. But it's unfortunate that in America we have to endure this as we are citizens just simply exercising the freedom of speech and the freedom of organize, to organize, which is guaranteed through the Constitution. Uh, we are not heretics, we are not terrorists, witches, problems. We are labeled as troublemakers. Um, I'd like to speak relative specifically again to that violation which occurred on last week's art walk. I didn't see any other venues that were shut down. Again, this was an art walk, a venue that we have been enjoying for five or six years. It encourages participation of the, uh, the whole community. We were black people. I feel that since that directive and that notice to uh, uh, hold us accountable for licensing of live music, which, you know, obviously we've been in violation for five years, we were not noticed prior. I feel that because our artists were about to perform without ample notice that the city is responsible for all expenses incurred, for the time, energy, gas, and whatever else expenses that they incurred, because this notice should have been given two or three weeks ago or just after that melee. We did not participate in any action. We were not that we weren't even present with that, you know, confrontation between the 99% and the police. So why should we suffer for it? Thank you. Thank you. And again, I apologize for mispronouncing your middle name. Uh, I'd like to uh, recess the regular meeting and move into the special meeting. And as we move into the special meeting, if we could take up item 15. Uh, Mr. President, call the roll first. Uh, okay, Alarco, go ahead. Gallino, Cardenas, Englander, Garcetti, Wizard, Caress, Gregorian, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Zion, Wesson. 12 members present, a quorum, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. Again, we'll take up item 15. There are no cards, no speakers on the queue. If we could, uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, items 13 and 14 have been called special by Mr. Sachs. So if you'd come forward and we'll do item 13 first. Well, thank you. Good, morning. Good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. I held item 13 because within this item on your agenda, it mentions newly hired power system personnel. So DWP is hiring new personnel, yet the city is having a budget deficit. How is that happening? And how are you addressing the DWP pension system program? I believe it's been deferred for a couple of years and taking any action on it. You're hiring new personnel, but you're not stepping up and you're concurring with the board. What happened to Fred Pickle? Did he have a voice in this action either? Or there? Or there? Thank you. I mean, how is it, how many people are you hiring? How new, many new people are being hired here? It doesn't mention. And the training? Training for the elderly, uh, the other ones? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. There are no speakers in the queue on this item. Could we open the roll? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay, now we'll go to item 14, card by Mr. Arnold Sachs. 
Miss Perry, I see your name up on the board. Okay. Yes, Mr. Sachs. Yes, thank you again, Arnold Sachs. Um, fascinating in today's Daily Breeze, county homeless get $105 million for housing and aid. Uh, it's going to rent those subsidies for 587 residents for 15 years. They're going to build 200 apartment units for the homeless. There are estimated 51,000 homeless in Los Angeles, of which 13,000 are considered chronic or on the streets for a year. And just on Tuesday, the County Board of Supervisors took some action on a development. They increased the density, I believe, to 50, it's going to be a 51 or 57 unit pro uh, project on Avalon Boulevard in South Central LA for um, chronic homeless and uh, developmentally disabled personnel. They have a program that provides services. Why isn't the city investing into looking into that program instead of just pushing money from one pot to the other? And as I asked at the county, why aren't they using these people who are developing this program as a blueprint for other homeless projects throughout the county? 13,000 chronic homeless. Do something. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Uh, let's prepare to vote on this, Madam Clerk, if, if you could please open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, have we completed all of the items from the special meeting? Yes. Forthwith on item 14. Okay, let's go forthwith on items 13 and 14, it's my understanding. Uh, Madam Clerk, I do believe we've uh, dealt with every item in the special meeting, so let's adjourn the special meeting and return to our regular meeting. Uh, and now that we've returned to our regular meeting, what uh, is before us? A special one motion has been circulated. Um, City Attorney will speak to the findings. Okay, Mr. City Attorney, if you would speak to the findings. Thank you, Mr. President. I will recite the facts as presented to me by the maker of the motion for the council's consideration of the adequacy of the findings. This past Wednesday, the state Senate had its second reading of a high-speed rail bill that had been gutted and amended to add language forbidding a municipality from restricting the importation of solid waste into a privately owned landfill. Immediate action is required for the full council to vote to oppose AB 845 before its third reading on August 20th. Council must first make findings pursuant to government code section 54954.2 before considering the substantive motion. Let's vote on the finding, findings. Uh, I didn't hear you. I don't have a special one in front of me. Uh, could somebody please get special one, a copy of that, to uh, Mr. Kokorian? Thank you. Good staff work, Eric. Good staff. So are you comfortable in voting just for, on the findings and then maybe take a few minutes to review that? So let's, uh, Madam Clerk, prepare to vote on the findings. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Mr. Englander, before I call on you, th those of us uh, that served in Sacramento, and I look around and I see that uh, Mr. Alicon is here and Mr. Koretz is still here and myself, it would appear that this is a form of a gut and amend, yep. basically where you've had a bill that has stated uh, specifically what it, and Mr. Krikorian was there, specifically what it was going to do, and at the last minute you eliminate that information, and then you stick in new information that does not always have a relationship yeah, with the old language that was in the bill. So with that said, uh, Mr. Englander. Yes, no, thank you very much for articulating that well. That's exactly what happened in this case, and it's not the first time. Um, this was originally uh, was supposed to be a high-speed rail bill, and it was converted and gutted and amended to be uh, local control of landfills lost to our own jurisdiction. Uh, basically, essentially, it would prevent land use restrictions that restrict, which we have here in the city of Los Angeles, out-of-county waste in the Sunshine Canyon. 
uh, and that's the city's only operational landfill. What the attempt is to do is to, it's an end run around voters in Northern California on an existing quick fix on some landfills operations in Northern California. We've had this actually come before and we've taken the same position to say no, we actually want to stop out of county waste coming into our own county and city of Los Angeles and that's essentially what this does. So um, I ask for your yes vote in opposition to AB 845 which is what this does. I've given you a copy of that. I've got the legislative history as well if anybody needs any anything. I believe they could have done something more site specific. Specific. It could have been site specific what. if it was done by the county, but the state decided that she's trying to fight for gotcha. her own district. I get it, but I got gotcha. you. It, it affects Mr. us. Mr. Sachs has a card. Thank you. Good afternoon again, Arnold Sachs, and thank you, Councilman Englander, for mentioning one of my favorite projects, the Sunshine Canyon landfill, because I'm wondering again. It's actually one of the first items I ever spoke up about at the County Board of Supervisors because I couldn't understand the math that was involved when they increased the size of the Sunshine Canyon landfill from 12,100 tons of waste per day, or excuse me, from 6,000 6, tons per day to 12,600 tons per day to 66,000 tons per week from 36,000 tons per week. And I said, well, if you double 36 times two, that's 72, Where's the extra 6,000 tons go? So you're discussing what the state is doing to the county of California in the Sunshine Canyon landfill, but yet nobody here has stepped up and said, 6,600 tons of waste is unaccounted for to Sunshine Canyon landfill weekly. That comes to like a lot of tons on a yearly basis. Over 30 years, because that's what the contract's for. It's 20 years of free garbage to be not counted for for the public's benefit because they get money for that waste that's hauled into the Sunshine Canyon landfill. And if you did the math, it comes to about 20 years worth of free trash. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sachs. Mr. LeBon. Yeah, this does not affect anything we have with uh, Kern County and our ability to use the lands there. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Burtson. Thank you for that. Very good. Okay. Oh, Mr. Alacon. I just, I just want to make sure that we are not, uh, does this in any way inhibit our ability to export uh, trash? Um, it, it, it doesn't, but it could. Um, but no, it does not. Okay, this, um, if this would prohibit a local jurisdiction's uh, ability to um, to so limit we, the importation, right. I'm concerned that I don't know. I, I'd li sure like to have a report from the department. Let, let, me, let me address that wait, real wait, quick. It's, it's my time, but um, I, I would like to have the opportunity for the department to explain whether or not we export more than we import. Well, let's let Mr. If I can explain that yeah. very yeah. easily. Uh, right now, this is basically um, usurping, taking our control, local control out of it. If we have agreements, if cities or counties or landfills have agreements with other municipalities, those exist. What this does is the state saying those agreements are no longer valid. We're taking control and you can't um, and you don't have that authority. So we have those agreements right now. What this legislation would do is not allow us to have those agreements. So you're absolutely right. It would, it would essentially lock our hands and tie our hands behind our back. And, uh, and so in those rare scenarios where we've got an issue where we do divert uh, some of the tons to another county, those would no longer exist if this legislation passed. Mr. Alicom. I, I don't question Mr. Mr. Englander's intent. I'm just concerned that the ramifications could have a negative impact on us. So I'd, I'd like to get a report from the department as to whether or not we are exporting more of this stuff than importing it. Uh, because if, if, if local jurisdictions are allowed to put uh, prohibitions, other jurisdictions in California where we may send our trash may put those same prohibitions in, blocking our ability to get rid of it. So. I would sure like to get a report from uh, the department, uh, uh, the Bureau okay, of Sanitation now, on this. Let me ask a question, uh, Mr. And we have other people in the, the, the queue. Uh, Mr. Englander, when is this scheduled? Well, I know they're on a short time frame. That, that's why this is Rule 23. It's coming. This was, the bill was just gutted and amended and changed on the 15th. It's due to come on the 20th, just a couple days. So we're not even going to meet again. 
by the time this is gone back through committee. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Mr. Reyes. Hit the nail on the head, Council President. I was asking that on the timing issue, uh, do we have time for discretion? Do we have time for review? Uh, is there a way to uh, address the concerns that are being uh, fleshed out? So I, uh, that, that's important uh, to understand. Because uh, what if it does limit our exporting? But what, do we know, Councilman Glinder, what, what? So going, going, back, going back to that, and if, if I've got the bill here, if you'd like to look at it, take yeah. a, more, a few more minutes to do that. Um, but basically what it does, it would prevent land use restrictions. It's a local control issue. Gotcha. That's all it does. It's local control. It's not, it's not allowing us to have local control in any cities or counties over either private or municipal landfills in the state of California, and that's all it does. It's local control. And so that's where it would uh, impact us. We wouldn't have that ability anymore. Mr. And, Mr. Englander, yes. be before I call on Mr. Krikorian, do we have a list of the uh, other municipalities that are in opposition? Yeah. La I'm asking him a question. Go on your side of the room. Get back on your side of the room. We'll put, put a leash. Uh, anyway, Mr. Englander. Yes. Are there other local governments that you are aware of that uh, have concerns about local control issues, in fact, taking those local controls away? Uh, do we know if there are any other cities? I, I know that, uh, yeah, and I know that the, the League of California Cities worked with us uh, last time this came up, and we worked with a lot of other cities last time. This, unfortunately, this time was done just a couple days ago. Um, and so I don't know even how many people have caught it, gotcha. quite frankly. And where we would be impacted the most is our, our largest landfill, one of the largest landfills, quite frankly, in the entire country. The other thing that this does, by the way, is if you cite a landfill or have an agreement with a landfill, uh, either one or that you're operating, and you have a guarantee of tonnage, call it 6,000 tons. Um, and that it, you, you know that you've locked in and secured rates and that you have a lifetime on that landfill. If you follow this logic, the problem is the operator could get greedy when the numbers fall, and the numbers fall in, in dumping and tipping, by the way, when uh, in a bad economy, because people are accumulating less trash and throwing out less trash, believe it or not. And so it follows the economy. Um, and so when those numbers go down, the landfill operators oftentimes want to bring in more money. And so they'll start bringing in out of county uh, waste, but now you've lost the years and your planning and everything that you've done to negotiate the terms and, and the cost of the tipping fees. And so now you have a long-term, not only economic impact, but you also have an issue of where you're going to dump your trash in the long term as well if you haven't come up with any backup plan. So the local control issue is critically important, and, and that's why this legislation um, we've got to oppose it, and as every other city and county would as well. Okay. I can remember being in Sacramento and a guy, a reporter, saying, Mr. Speaker, are you going to kill this bill? And not this one in particular. And I said, in Sacramento, there's no such thing as killing a bill. They're like vampires. They come back right. to life during the night. And I heard you mention earlier that this is... Uh, uh, something that we've dealt with it was very similar now I've been informed that Mr. Miller uh, would have a good answer and then I will call on Mr. Krikorian uh, and Ms. Perry and Mr. Alicone Jerry can you sort through this uh, I, I can, at least in terms of the amount of trash that there's, is shipped outside the city as a matter of fact I negotiated the last amendment to the Sunshine uh, Canyon Agreement um, and this is all from memory, but I, I believe the city has six waste sheds. Under the Sunshine Canyon, all six of them originally had to go to Sunshine Canyon, and that was the basis for the rate we were getting. The council wanted to diversify um, our, our abilities to find other sources and alternatives, so there was an amendment to the contract uh, probably about six years ago that allowed one of those six waste sheds to be shipped out to another landfill. I don't remember which landfill it is. So five of the six waste sheds continue to go to Sunshine, and I believe it's less than one-tenth of the total trash goes to another uh, landfill. 
Mr. Kokorian. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, I, I know some of you have noticed that I often oppose special motions because I think that they don't give us sufficient opportunity to do the analysis and discussion that we should have in making policy. Um, the reason that I'm standing in support of this special motion is because that's precisely what's happening with this gut and amend bill in Sacramento. And all of us who've been there and have done gut and amend bills or had to vote on them know of the paucity of analysis that you get when you have something that lands on your desk to deal with an important policy issue. And there's been no committee analysis. There's been no, you know, analysis of it at all. Well, here we have a bill that directly impacts on local control. There's no justification that I can imagine that this has to come in as a gut and amend bill that hasn't been heard by the local, uh, the Committee on Local Government or any of the other policy analysis steps that usually happen in Sacramento. So I think that is reason enough uh, for us to stand in opposition to this bill, which impacts on local control. Second. Um, the concerns that Mr. Alicone raised and that Mr. Miller just spoke to, I think, um, are real because we do have those issues that we have to deal with as the biggest city in California with the biggest waste stream. Um, but what this bill would do is change the status quo. Um, our, our ability to, it would prohibit future uh, prohibitions uh, by local government. Right now, what's going on, you know, w with our waste stream, um, w w it wouldn't be impacted at all by this bill, as I understand it. So, I mean, I suppose that if some local government chose in the future that we have a relationship with now to, to bar our sending waste to them, they could do that now under current law. This bill would prohibit local governments from being able to do that. So um, it, 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 this bill, if it were to pass, would restrict our ability to control what comes into Los Angeles. But the status quo um, of what we do in sending out is, is not impacted by, by our action today in opposing this bill. So I, I just stand in support of the special. I think we should stand in opposition to this. We can have a further, deeper discussion about the policy implications of having a statewide policy on, on moving waste around. But the way it should not be done is uh, end of session, gut and amend uh, bill without analysis. Ms. Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, the League of Cities hasn't taken a position on this, am I correct? Uh, again, not that we know of. It's so recent that we're not aware of anybody being able to f formally take a position. Did they? Well, on the previous bill. Okay. Yes, on the previous bill. And this is the, essentially the same language? Uh, yes, that's my understanding. Yes. And so why was it brought up then a second time? I, you'd have to. I'm, I'm sorry. You'd have to ask the, the author of the motion. I, uh, my understanding is that there's sort of a, a territorial-specific issue that's been gone after, and but I don't know that this bill. Bill. Well, this is a broad bill. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alacon. Council members, um, I'd like to make several points. First of all, I think uh, local control uh, arguments are uh, far outweighed. Uh, we, we have to look at not just the, the issue of local control, but also the issues of the substance of the matter. In this case, uh, the substance has to do with uh, our waste stream, and my questions were really focused on whether or not we would benefit from the bill or be harmed by the bill uh, on the basis of whether we're sending trash out or bringing trash in. And, uh, and then whether or not we have the uh, opportunity to control that flow. I am uh, uh, persuaded by Mr. Miller that, um, that we are not going to be in the position to be hampered by this bill uh, for at least 35 years by his guess, his best guess. Um, so in 35 years, I would be opposed to uh, Mr. Englander's uh, motion, but today I'm happy to support it. Mr. Englander, to close. Um, just quickly, and thank you, colleagues. Um, the opposition to 1178, which is this is a replica of, was Alameda Cal County, California League of Conservation Voters, California Resource Recovery Association, California's Against Waste, the City of Glendale, Kern County, League of California Cities, 
the entire association, LA County Board of Supervisors, LA County Solid uh, Management Authority, and then NRDC were all opposed to the last bill. And then just quickly, it only just says, and this is that simple, that this bill would prohibit an ordinance enacted by a city or county, including an ordinance enacted by initiative by the voters of a city or county from otherwise restricting or limiting the importation of solid waste into a privately owned solid waste facility in the city or county based on the place of origin. That's all it does. Okay, so no, more I ask for your yes. no more speakers in the queue. Uh, Madam Clerk, let's prepare to vote on this item. Let us, if you would please, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay, that brings us where? Forthwith? For, forthwith, if I could, please, yes. That brings us where? Mr. President, for the record, Mr. Parks has withdrawn his amendment to item number two. So d does that mean we must take some additional action? Or? No, no, I was just stating it for the record. Okay, fine. It, what Now, again, what's before this body? Council has motions for posted and referred. They're posted and referred. The desk is clear. Okay. Uh, announcements, members. Mr. LaBange. This Sunday in Hollywood... Uh, we'll celebrate and recognize the 35th anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley. American Cinema Tech will join with Mike Stroller, the great uh, partner of Lieber and Stroller, who wrote so many hits with the showing of uh, Jailhouse Rock. And this will be at the American Cinema Tech, which is the Egyptian Theater at 6712 Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood, California. Long live the king of rock and roll and Elvis Presley, and remember his life. Thank you, Mr. LeBange. Other announcements, members? Other announcements? Well, if everyone in the council chambers could please rise for adjourning motions. If everybody would please rise. Adjourning motions, members. Mr. Krikorian? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, members, I'd like to rise today to ask that the city council adjourn in memory of United States Marine Corps Captain Matt Manukian, who was killed in action Friday at a police checkpoint in Afghanistan, along with two of his other brother Marines serving our country. Uh, Matt Manukian was the son of Superior Court Judge Socrates Pete Manukian and Court of Appeal Associate Justice Patricia Bamatre Manukian. Uh, he had dreamed of becoming, becoming a member of the Marine Corps since he was 10 years old. Uh, he was an honor student who graduated from the University of Arizona in 2005 with a degree in political science. A year later, he attended officer candidate school in Quantico and then infantry school in 2007. Um, after seven years of service in the Marine Corps, Matt was looking forward to completing his service, uh, wrapping up his service to our country, and at the end of the year uh, was planning to attend uh, law school next year and follow in his uh, parents' footsteps. Uh, unfortunately, he won't have that opportunity uh, because uh, he gave the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Uh, he's survived by his mother and his father, uh, Pete and Patricia, as well as his brothers, Michael and Martin. He is uh, well-loved and well-respected in his community. Uh, may he rest in peace and may, he, may his passing be a reminder to all of us of the service that's given to our country every day by the men and women in uniform of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. Well said. Other adjourning motions? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, this council meeting is adjourned.